Media in the workroom, uh, Tennessee is scheduled to be in the interview room in just a few seconds, so you might want to head this way if you're covering the volunteers um, game tomorrow. Uh, some announcements to make. Uh, transcripts, you can find them on ncaa.com slash transcripts. Of course, they will be distributed here in the arena. Uh, when you come to the interview room, please silence your cell phones. Remember, there is no flash photography and no video of any kind, cell phone, whatever, okay? Um, satellite coordinates. It's been told Tennessee is en route to the interview room. Satellite coordinates are Galaxy 17 KU Band, Transponder 17C, 12044.5 horizontal, symbol rate is 7.2, and the FEC is 5 over 6. And our last uh, comments are please direct questions to specific athletes if you could. Wait for the microphone and state name and affiliation. And I think I hear the Vols coming down the steps as we speak. alarm that was Susan's story <laughs> Chuck and Kurt I'm depending on you guys to keep us going for 40 minutes Long time no see. How have we been? Ready for more questions? How are we doing? You get to uh, try to get your legs in there and carry you. <laughs> okay, everyone, welcome to day three. Of, uh, now we're going into the second round of the NCAA Basketball Championship. We will begin our interview session today with the volunteers of the University of Tennessee. As you can tell by the name cards on stage, our student athletes are uh, Jordan Bone, Grant Williams, Admiral Schofield, Kyle Alexander, and uh, Jordan Bowden. Let's go to questions for the guys. Remember, please state name and affiliation. Okay, first question here on this uh, main left section. It's right here. Um, Wendell Barnhouse with The Athletic. For Admiral and Grant, I don't know if you guys spent much time looking at stuff last night, but obviously Loyola had a last second victory. Did you guys see any online video of the shot and what did, what did you think about it? Was this for anybody in particular? Admiral and Grant, okay. Admiral, we'll let you go first. Um, yeah, um, I was actually at Shake Shack <laughs> watching the shot. <laughs> Uh, it was a big shot, um, and uh, Ingram, who hit it, actually played against him in high school. You know, he went to Simeon uh, downtown, so it's a big shot for him, um, but, you know, really for their program. Yeah, I say the same thing. Uh, it was a terrific shot. Um, got a good look, and um, they're a talented team. They moved the ball well, and it was a competitive game, so I was actually watching it with a couple of teammates in the, door, or the hotel room, so... Um, it was kind of exciting because March Madness, and you kind of get hyped up for it. So it was a good shot. 
Um, Shake Shack is my thing. I'd we're gonna say. we're gonna keep Grant away from. Yeah, he don't need that. <laughs> we're gonna keep Grant away from Shake Shack. <laughs> okay, other questions. We'll go back to the right over here, right in the middle of the room, please. Uh, Joe Rexford of the Tennessee, and actually for both of you also, if you weren't playing Loyola, would this be a team you might be rooting for in this tournament? Grant and Admiral, is that right? Okay, uh, Grant, why don't you go first? <laughs> uh, I'd say so. Um, you like teams like these, the ones that um, fight all odds and compete, and that's something that you love. Like, we're, we're a type of team like that. Um, not many people chose us, and... Um, we're fighting for the same thing they are. So if we weren't playing for them, you kind of get excited and you kind of enjoy March and the madness side of it. But um, really, we we just got to focus on the game and play our play our game. Yeah, like you said, most most of the times in March Madness, a lot of the people pick the underdogs. You know, they want the underdogs to beat the bigger schools and you know, just like Buffalo and Arizona last night, teams like that. But the biggest thing about March Madness is anybody can go on a run, and it's about you know the chemistry and executing and really what goes into winning. You know, people playing unselfishly, sacrificing for the team and for the for the greater good. So the biggest thing is for us is to comp continue to play hard. You know, we we don't have as much talent as other schools, but you know, we have people that work hard and are willing to go out and do their jobs consistently. So uh, for us, we just got to continue to do that. Let's go in the middle here on the right. Yeah. Rob Lewis with VolQuest.com. Kyle, I'll, I'll ask you kind of, you know, Grant sort of brought it up a little bit, but you guys have been you know, the underdogs all year long. We've asked you about being picked 13th for months now, and tomorrow you're going to be the bully against, the, you know, a team that, that is the underdog. How, did, how does that mindset work for you guys? Have you thought about it at all? I mean, yeah, so, you know, when, like, when you've been the underdog um, the whole year, you know, you kind of carry a little bit of a chip on your shoulder, and it's kind of a little bit of a motivation for your team to kind of just do what you've been working on all off season and all season. But, you know, just – just like yesterday's game and just like any other game in the season, you know, it's just a regular game that we have to go out and we have to work on our um, keeping our identity and, you know, being who we are and playing our Tennessee defense and just, you know, going and playing our basketball. And, you know, we can't look at it as any other way, you know. Okay, we'll stay here on the right. Skyler Dixon with the AP. Admiral, you touched on this just a little bit just now, but – do you think parity is changing the definition of a Cinderella, and what is your definition of a Cinderella? Um, well, the biggest thing is, you know, in the Cinderella story, is just it's teams that people don't expect to come out and compete against the, you know, the the, the big dogs. And I, I mean, I don't I don't believe in the Cinderella story. I believe anybody can be beat. It just takes, you know, a buy-in from a, a, a collective unit. And like for us, I would say, you know, we were picked 13th. And the biggest thing for us was, you know, we didn't think we were 13. And when you have that collective, a collective group believing in something bigger than itself, I mean, you can do anything, especially when you put the work in. Um, and, you know, when you put the work in, eventually you'll reap the blessing of it. So for us, I would say that, um, I, I mean, I, me personally, I don't believe in Cinderella story. It's just who, who, who wants it more in, in that aspect. Okay, we'll move to the uh, middle here on the right side. Grant Raymond, 247 Sports. Uh, for the two Jordans, do you guys expect it to be like a, a road game, the, the kind of the arena against you guys tomorrow with, you know, uh, Texas Tech and Florida fans, you know, che cheering for the underdog and, and trying to get Loyola? Let's start with uh, Jordan Bone first on that answer. Jordan? Um, yes, I, I, would, I would imagine that the atmosphere would be leaning towards Loyola. Uh, but like Kyle mentioned, simply because they would they would be considered the underdog in this, and um, during this time of the season, that's who who people often root for. So, um, I mean, I, I would imagine um, that the atmosphere would be like that. It's kind of been like that the entire season for us, though. Um, I mean, our backs have been against the wall, and um, we we're, we're just ready. We're ready to play tomorrow. Yeah, uh, like Bone said, you know. Loyola has a lot of, you know, fans out there, you know, and a lot of people going against us, you know, but we just got to be out, go out focused and be ready for them for tomorrow. Okay, guys, here on the front row on the right. Chuck Carlton, Dallas Morning News. For, for Admiral, growing up in Zion near Chicago, I was just curious, what were your perceptions of Loyola? Were they ever on your radar screen as a possible destination? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, um, they were. Uh, they recruited me out of high school and in the summers, we would play a lot of summer leagues up there, so I would be in the gym a lot. And um, it's a really nice school downtown. And uh, 
But the biggest thing for me was I wanted to get out the cold and the snow. I got tired of shoveling every winter and and all that. So I wanted to get out. But I love going home. Um, love the deep dish pizza. Love being downtown and going to Millennium and all that. So you know, it's, it'll be it's pretty cool to be able to play against a school like that. Growing up, you know, them being right, you know, 20 minutes away from the house. But at the same time, you know, I'm really really focusing on you know playing hard for Tennessee, going out and giving my all for Tennessee. Midway back on the right. Josh Peter with USA Today for Admiral and <clears throat> Grant, excuse me. I don't know if you saw this, but Loyola has a 98-year-old nun praying for them. How can you guys compete against that? Grant, we'll let you take that, I guess. Is that a 98-year-old nun? Oh, a 98-year-old nun. Oh, um, I don't know. Uh, she's, <laughs> she's, I feel like she's aggressive, you know. She pushes the ball up the court. <laughs> but she's she's super nice. I saw her on TV, and um, uh, we respect that. And we we just to have that around is something special. And you just you love it with, at this time of the year. Well, for us, I mean, that's hard to compete with. Not nearly, but you know we we have our traditions as well. But you know we're just gonna go out and compete. Other questions for any of our five student athletes? Okay, guys, back on this side in the middle. Rob Lewis with VolQuest.com. Uh, Kyle, you, you mentioned the phrase, we have to beat Tennessee, you know, not let the outside stuff affect us, play our game. How much better have you guys gotten at doing that this year, just focusing on yourselves and not worrying about the opponent? I think a lot better because, you know, we were relatively young, you know, last year, and we, and we, we got some experience, and, you know, this year, um, We've, we've never been a team that, you know, when we went places, uh, we know we sold out stadiums and stuff like that. And, you know, we've been through a lot. We've experienced a lot this year. And I think that this team has, has matured a lot in the sense of, you know, learning how to, to shut out all the outside noise, you know, all that stuff and really focus on, on our game plan, our scouting report, and what we do. So I think that we've gotten a lot better at that this year. And I think that we can continue to get better at that. Okay, here in the middle. For Kyle and Grant, uh, after looking at Loyola, what kind of challenges will they present to you guys defensively? And, and I guess, what did you think about the way they executed as well uh, late game yesterday? We'll let Grant go with this. As I said, um, they're a talented offensive team. Um, they move the ball really well. They have a lot of motion. And um, they're just aggressive. And on defense, they um, depend on the lineup, they might switch everything. And you just got to prepare and, and execute your, your game plan. Coaches do a good job pairing us, so we just got to go out there, find the shooters, and um, cons consistently um, get those rebounds as well. OK, and Kyle? Oh, no, he, he, he got it. He covered it? Yeah, he covered it. OK. OK, we'll stay here in the middle. I meant to add this on the last question. But they, come, they remind you of anyone you guys played this year? Anybody in particular you want to answer? Um, they, they run similar offense to uh, Vandy, um, but the biggest thing is we've seen a, pretty much everything you can possibly see offensively. It's just about going out competing, like I said earlier, and being on edge and knowing what they're going to run and trying to pressure them out of it and um, just understanding they're going to do the same thing on the other end. They're going to switch, like Grant said, and try to put pressure on us as well, but we got to be aggressive on the boards and you know be really physical and, and be really strong with the ball. Okay, again in the middle here on the right. Over here, and we'll come back okay. over there. Go ahead. For, for Admiral Kyle, you guys all obviously won a lot of SEC awards after the regular season, but you guys didn't have anybody on the all-SEC defensive team. What, what goes into to being such a good defensive team and thought not having any standout individuals? Um, I was I was actually surprised that Kyle didn't make it. Um, I actually that was one of my goals to be on a defensive team. And I didn't really care about all SEC to be honest. No disrespect to our league, but I really wanted to be on a defensive team more than anything. But I really thought Kyle would have made it. But you know, it's just I think it's ironic. You know, us being one of the top five teams in the country, I think as far as defensive percentages and ratings and all that stuff, and no one's on the list. But you know, at the end of the day, most of the times it's, it's opinions over statistics and. For us, we're just going to keep competing, and we're going to keep going out and doing what we do. We're not worried about, you know, getting the words or acc accolades. We're really just trying to win championships and, you know, really make our university proud, our families proud, and our coaching staff proud. 
Okay, on the right. Admiral, uh, you mentioned playing against Dante. What was the game and um, what were your impressions of him? Well, I, I played against him on the AAU circuit more than anything, but you know, he's very athletic, um, very shifty with the ball. You know, he played, I mean, he's a city kid. He plays city ball and very tough, tough nosed guy. But biggest thing is, you know, a lot of us that come up in that area, that's how we play ball. We're very tough. Um, we pride ourselves in being able to get to the rim, being able to shoot the outside shot and, you know, having some, somewhat of a mid range game. So guys who can do everything, and he can do that. And, you know, he can, he can oppose problems for a lot of, a lot of teams. And for us, we just got to be ready to guard that. Okay, let's move to the left side on the inside aisle. Wendell Barnhouse from The Athletic for Kyle. Um, Loyola really likes to space the floor offensively and do a lot of driving and kicking and that sort of stuff. And, you know, Miami was able to help at the rim on a lot of their penetration. The way they play, what's the challenge defensively for you guys? I mean, obviously you guys are a really good defensive team, but when a team is trying to space you out, uh, what are the challenges for the team in general? Um, I'd say the main thing is kind of like our white line presence, and that's kind of, you know, just loading up in the middle of the paint, you know, and um, you're not, when your man is not guarding the ball and somebody on the other side of the court has the ball, you know, we're loading up on the white line and just making sure that you're um, providing uh, help for your teammates because, you know, like you mentioned, um, t defense is really like, a, it's, it's a team thing, you know, you can't just rely on one person for it, and so, you know, that's, I think that's why our team does so well is because we, we really play a lot of help defense, we help our teammates out, so. Okay, here on the right, on the outside aisle. Kyle, can you just update your health? Uh, saw you had an ice pack on your hip yesterday. How's that? Um, it's good. You know, I've, I just had a little bit of a bone bruise on my hip, and uh, you know, I've been with the trainers all day, and I'm gonna continue to be with them. See how it looks. Anything else for our student athletes? I don't see any hands up. We'll let you go back to the locker room, guys. I know you just had practice, so. Uh, We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for coming. Um, Tennessee's SID, Tom Satkoviak, is right here. So if you need anything else from the balls, just see Tom. Okay, we are now joined by uh, Coach Rick Barnes of the University of Tennessee. Coach, it's been about 24 hours to think about it, I guess. Uh, your thoughts going into tomorrow? Well, again, you get into this tournament, you realize that everybody that's playing, they're here for a reason. And you look at Loyola, you realize uh, they haven't, what, they've lost one game since January. You win 29 games, you shoot 50% as a group, and uh, five guys in double figures. It's just a, a team that, uh, one, looking at them and watching them play, you enjoy watching them with the way they share, share the ball, the way they move the ball, and the way I think they really understand how to play together. Thank you, Coach. Questions now for Coach Barnes. Okay, in the middle. Rob Lewis with VolQuest.com. Coach, um, your, your guys, Looked like they had been here before yesterday. Were you surprised at the poise that they showed? Again, or did you, what did you expect? You know, I'm not sure about what to expect. Actually, you know, uh, we thought they would come out a little bit jittery, which they did. You know, we we missed some shots there, but uh, I, I did feel like looking back on it, they were locked in defensively, and we had actually told them that uh, coming out of the tournament in um, St. Louis, that, you know, we had really had one really good game where we played uh, for 40 minutes the way we needed to. We 
uh, and what team was going to show up here. And uh, so they came out yesterday, and I thought they were really locked in on the defensive end. And, and uh, then we did get things going offensively, but um, to be honest, I, I wasn't sure what to really expect. Okay, here on the outside aisle. Skyler Dixon with the AP. Rick, these days is a team in the seed range of Loyola still a Cinderella, quote unquote, and if not, what's your definition of a Cinderella these days? Well, I think with college basketball now, the parity and, you know, once years ago when we went back to 13 scholarships and, uh, you know, the fact that players transfer now, we know that that's been an epidemic in college basketball and uh, every team has good players. And uh, I think you realize that when, when you start playing early in the year and you even get into your non-league schedule, you realize that uh, maybe your players don't see it at first, but I think over time they really do have a great respect at how many guys in the country can play. And so when you talk about a team that, if you want to say Cinderella or whatever, it's probably a team that's doing the unexpected. And, uh, but that could probably, that label could be probably said about a lot of people and uh, in some ways. But uh, all I can tell you today in college basketball, there's a lot of guys that can play and with the rules uh, where guys can transfer and sit out and another year sitting out uh, makes a big difference. And teams that get older, uh, and most of those guys end up getting older, and teams that I think that stay together. One thing that we wanted to do with our program was to get our team old. And uh, we knew we were going to start young, but we want to get old and we want to stay old if, if we possibly can. Okay. Again, here on the right. Uh, Kirk Bowles from the Austin American Statesman. Uh, Rick, a lot of your players were asked about the 98-year-old nun as the sixth man for Loyola. Uh, I wonder if you worry about that karma and you're going to bring in a priest or chaplain to counter that tomorrow? Or? Well, I can tell you one of the best things that we've done all year is uh, we've had a, a power talk that uh, we have Scott Jackson, who's uh, actually my pastor and local uh, minister in Knoxville, and, and uh, Chris Walker, who's with Fellowship of Christian Athlete. Of all the things that we've done on the court, my biggest thrill has been to see what's happened with our team within our program. That's been the biggest thing. And uh, uh, I do believe that God is sovereign. I believe he's in charge and controls everything. And uh, I'm not sure I believe in karma, but uh, I do believe in God and that he's in control. But uh, I can tell you, like I just said, what, what's going on with our players uh, uh, off the court has, has been as big a win for us as, as winning the games. You mentioned you want to grow old and stay old. You know, seniors are, can kind of be a lost commodity in college basketball. Uh, are we, will we ever see that change and maybe the NBA change their one and done rule? Could we maybe see more juniors and seniors in college? Yeah, I, I do think it will happen. I, I think the rule is close to being here. I, I, I don't think it'll be a year or so away, maybe even could come in quicker than that, that that, um, that high school you know, prospects will have a chance to enter that league if they want to. I, I think that's going to happen. But you look around, there's some teams that have been that way for quite some time. I mean, Virginia's a team that's shown that. Um, I think of other teams. I think of uh, Gonzaga has been a team that's done a lot of that too. Uh, Wichita State, I think of that. I'm not sure on those, but uh, when I think of that, I think of guys that have guys that stayed in their program for periods of time and have had success with it. And I'm sure there's other ones that I, I'm just I'm not up on all of it. But uh, uh, again, I do think that uh, it'll, it'll all trend. But I, I just think it's just around the corner before the NBA drops that rule and lets guys come right out of high school. Now up front. Chuck Carlton, Dallas Morning News. Rick, you've coached teams that had one and done guys and five-star guys. Now you've got guys who are maybe uh, a little under the recruiting radar. Is there a difference in groups when you have guys who maybe weren't given all the notoriety or aren't looking at the, you know, going to the NBA after one year? Well, I, I think there's – I think I don't know if there's any one specific thing. I mean, you know, I, I can tell you, I, every one-and-done guy that I coached, I really enjoyed coaching. And, and the guys, the best players that we had at Texas were our hardest-working guys. And, and, and I will tell you, whether people believe it or not, uh, 
they did not come in with that idea they were one and done. If they were, so be it, but they came in and they put both feet in. I think where the problem occurs is when they're not putting both feet in and they come in and like, hey, I'm only going to be here for eight or nine months. And, and uh, uh, I've always thought it was really tough if you sign a terrific player and, and the first thing he says is that he's leaving before he even gets on campus. I think that's a, uh, you know, and we talked to Kevin about it. We talked to LaMarcus, uh, TJ, and all those guys to make sure they realized that they were going to have to come in and be part of a team. And they didn't want to separate themselves right off the bat. And so I, I do think it's the way it's handled. And, uh, but I, I think we all know that you want talent and you want to recruit the most talented players you can recruit. But uh, sometimes in recruiting, those five-star guys are over-recruited. And sometimes those three-star guys are under, I mean, uh, overrated and, and the three-star guys are underrated. And uh, so we ourselves don't put a lot into what other people rate them. We've always said we're going to go out and evaluate ourselves and get the guys that we want and uh, that we think will fit what we're trying to do. Let's go in the middle. Joe Rexford with the Tennessee. And Rick, in your history in the NCAA tournament, have you encountered a double-digit seed like this with a story that people are rallying around, the building's getting behind them, they hit a shot like they did yesterday? And if so, does that stuff matter once, once the ball's tipped off? Yeah, I mean, I've, I, like I said earlier, I remember when we were at Clemson, I don't remember what the seed was, but I remember playing, a, I think it was Western Michigan. It had five fifth-year players on their team. It had one of those great years, and we were banged up a little bit, but still they, they beat us. And uh, uh, But we, you expect that in the tournament. Uh, you expect the uh, – there's three sets of crowds normally at the game. They have their fans, we have our fans, and then the neutral crowds have always, you know, most of the time when you think about it, they go for the underdog or the team wearing the darker jersey. They're not necessarily the underdog, but they're normally the team that's wearing the darker jersey. So you expect that. And, I mean, it can be like a road game, if that's what you want to call it. But uh, uh, you've got to play the game. You know, you got, you got to get in there and, and you just got to execute what you've talked about, understand there's the, the ups and downs of a game and just – Fight the game and understand it's 40 minutes or longer sometimes that you've just got to stay focused and locked in and, and, and understand how hard you got to compete to get the job done. Now on coaches left. Wendell Barnhouse from The Athletic. Rick, I wanted to ask you about Chris Chiosa, the guard for Florida. Um, is not, his numbers aren't really eye-popping, um, and this is really his first year as being the full-time point guard. But what have you, how have you seen him kind of evolve kind of from your side of the court as far as him becoming a player who's kind of the, I guess, the key to Florida, maybe. Well, you you, you love him when you when you coach against him. I mean, uh, he's the kind of player that uh, he's got tremendous speed and quickness. And when he gets going downhill, and he and he's a guy that really wants to pass the ball. I think Mike's done a terrific job with him. I mean, he's improved a lot from a year ago, where I think he's much more under control. A guy that really looks to play the position the way coaches want it played. But uh, when he really uh, – and they're, they're obviously a heavy ball screen team. And when he gets going downhill, he can really create havoc for your defense. And so he's a guy that going into the game that you have to give a lot of attention to because uh, if, if, he, if you don't get him contained and under control, he will set up a lot of guys and he can get to the basket and finish as well. He can shoot the ball. But he's a uh, – again, his biggest improvement, I think, has been the way he has really learned to get his teammates involved. Midway back on the right. Josh Peter with USA Today. Hey, Rick, back to the 98-year-old nun and God for a second. What kind of control do you think God will have on the outcome of the game? And can you tell us a little bit more about the power talks? Well, again, I, I think uh, all I can tell you is I think God is sovereign. And that means I think he's in charge of everything. He's the only guy that knows the future and because uh, he's made the future. And uh, our power talks, what we wanted to do was uh, – uh, Chris Walker came in, and since we had been there, we'd had uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, uh, Athletes in Action, both were on campus. And But when uh, Chris Walker played for Coach Former, and uh, when he uh, came back, I met him, and I knew a year ago he was going to move back to uh, Knoxville and be uh, lead that ch chapter on campus. And and I just, we've had, and he's one of the finest people I've ever been around. And uh, I just said, I'd like to be someone that's going to really be invested in our program and be around. And uh, 
I look back on my time as a head coach, uh, there's a lot of things that I wish I could go back and do different. And one of them would be that I wish I had done what we've done this year a long time ago, a lot more. And it's something that uh, Deer Knows Power talks. He's, uh, he's going to share the gospel. He's a former uh, player uh, that understands athletics, but uh, he is a very transparent person. He along with uh, Scott Jackson and it's real. And uh, we talk about it because, uh, you know, we know uh, just in the last uh, really two and a half, three weeks, people that I know have, have passed. And uh, you realize the brevity of life and how quick it goes. One of our former players, at my first player that we signed at Texas, uh, Chris Owens, came by this morning, hotel, and, and had breakfast with us. And, and one of the neat things has been to watch how I've had coached so many guys that have grown up to become wonderful fathers. and and uh, very successful in what they do. But um, what we've done with this team, like I said, with our power talks and what those guys have done has been just really something I'm most probably as proud of as anything we've done this year. Coaches left midway back. Henry Redmond, Loyola Phoenix. Coach, how, what have you seen from Loyola's big Cameron Crutwig, and then how do you plan on stopping him from getting down, like scoring a lot from the post tomorrow? Well, again, you, you love their balance as a team. I mean, five guys in double figures. I mean, you, you obviously are going to look at each player and see what, what you can do as, with as many tendencies as they have. But uh, he's a terrific player. And uh, we've always said uh, we don't think we can stop anybody one-on-one. -on -one. Our whole defense is set up on being a sound defensive team as a team. And uh, we expect our players to be on edge and understand whatever coverage we're in with ball screens, whatever we're doing with uh, the ball goes into the post understanding scout reports, who we feel like we want to help off of, who we don't want to help off of. And so it goes back to uh, our game plan in terms of um, each individual guy, how we're going to try to play him to really try to get as much uh, done as we can on the defensive end. We'll come back to the right. Uh, Rick, I know you're a big fan of Bob McKillop at Davidson. And I was curious in, in the evolution of your offense, Maybe how much the Davidson offense influenced that in any way? Yeah, oh yeah, Bob, Bob and I were together at Davidson, and uh, truly a, a, a man that I, a great friend, and, a, and a, as a man I admire as much as anybody I've been in the business with, and um, just a, again a great basketball coach. And yeah, I've learned from Bob. There's no doubt I've learned from him, but. Uh, I've, we've taken some of the things that he does, along with some things I've learned from Gary Williams and Wimp Sanderson that we're using this year that I back, uh, again, some, some things from Alabama, some things we get. So we've put it all together, kind of, and we will continue to do that, along with some of the things that our, my, my current coaching staff like uh, that we think that fits our team. And we've always believed that uh, we're going to change the system for the players to help them as opposed to trying to always force feed them into something they can't do and you know we're not a heavy ball screen team we have it as part of our package but it's, we're not that's not what we do but we can and uh, but uh, we like the movement we want to be different you know some people you know we want to play inside out and everybody knows that so there's no secrets with that but uh, I've been very blessed and uh, been around a lot of terrific coaches and assistants and guys I've worked for that uh, we've used a little bit of all of it that I've learned through the years. On the outside? What's gone into Derek Walker kind of cycling out of the rotation a little bit and John Fulkerson going this, in? It's nothing that Derek hasn't done anything. It's just Folky has been a guy that uh, continued to improve and Derek's the same way. We, we look at both of those guys based on matchups. That's what we base it on. But Derek hasn't done anything. He's uh, ready to play. It's just that uh, Folky's a guy that has given us good minutes the last couple games. And we're going to need them all tomorrow. And we know that. And uh, But Derek, is he's, he's getting better. And But he hasn't done anything. It's just a matter of the matchups that we've seen. We'll stay on the right. Rick, I don't know how much you're aware of this. But you know the SEC has gotten off to a pretty quick start in the tournament. I think winning their first five games, what does that say? About the, about the league not only getting a lot of teams in, but making the most of that opportunity? Well, you know, uh, as a league, uh, we talked about how good we think our league has been, and it, ha and it was a good league. I, but I've said every year, I think every league's good, you know, but who's the better league? That can be a, debated all the time. But I can only tell you from experience, this year was 
as tough a league as I've ever been a part of from top to bottom. It's, it was amazing. Uh, the, and then I'm excited because I'd like to be every year. You know, I, I tell people all the time when you when this season's over with uh, in another two weeks, people are going to start projecting next year how many teams the ACC is going to get in. Somebody's going to throw out eight or nine or ten. Somebody's going to throw out the big twelve, getting in eight or you know seven or eight. I want the big. I want the SEC to be a team that people know from the beginning. They're going to get seven, eight teams in, and on a bad year, it's going to be seven, and on a great year, it can be eight or nine. As opposed to people might say four. That most people have said four or five since I've been in the three years, and hopefully um, to do that is um, and, and probably in the past that's probably what it was they were do. I'm not saying they weren't doing anymore, but uh, changing perception is a hard thing to do. But it started a year ago, and so. The start of this tournament, uh, I was with our commissioner who has done a terrific job, and he said, you know, I was so excited uh, when it came out with the number of teams we got in. He said, but now I'm as nervous as I've ever been because we, we, we need to do well, and we, we, we know that. And uh, hopefully we can continue to do well. We've got some terrific coaches in our league and uh, guys that um, know what they're doing, and, and recruiting has been great in our league. And, We've got good teams. We really do. And uh, there's some other teams that were right there that probably had a chance, but uh, you end up beating up on each other. Closing questions for Coach Barnes. We'll go on the extreme left. Rick, Ken Davis from The Athletic. Um, your kids talk a lot about the team defense concept that you just mentioned and seem to take a lot of pride in that. Can you talk about tweaking your defense? Your, your basic defensive philosophy from year to year and how you adjust things to the, the personnel you have? Well, for two years at Tennessee, we haven't been very good on defense. And uh, we've had a couple guys. One of the hardest things to do as a coach is when you know you're going to struggle on offense if certain guys go out of the game. And when we first got there, we had two uh, seniors that we knew had to play 35, 36 minutes a game, and Armani Moore and Kevin Punter. We had to basically tell those guys, you guys can't get in foul trouble. And so you're basically – and not that they would – because both of those guys were really big competitors, but we couldn't extend our defense. We couldn't pressure the way we wanted to. And and we were – at the end, we were only playing six or seven guys. And last year we had a lot of these guys back, but they were – I mean, these guys come in and they were young and had no idea how hard you have to play at this level to be a good defensive team. They, they had no idea. And uh, – but we knew that uh, – after last year, the biggest way we could improve would be on the defensive end. If you go back and look at numbers, you'd be surprised if you rebound the ball three more times a game, how you can go from being in a team that's in the over 200 to in the top 25. If you turn the ball over three times left, the same numbers show up. And so we talked about how we've got to improve on, we really talked about four or five possessions, that we've got to get better at defensive rebound and we need to do a better job on the offensive boards. Got to get consecutive stops more. And uh, so our personnel, and, and the one thing with this year's team, by having the depth, we told our guys if they're not going to play hard on defense, they're not going to play. And, uh, and, that's, uh, and I think they know that. And so uh, hopefully we can – and we think we can be better. And going forward, we hope that we can be a better defensive team because we think we can be. Okay, it's 2.15. We are out of time for Coach Barnes. Coach, thank right. you for coming right. and thank being you with us. Thanks. Uh, good luck tomorrow. And about five minutes, the players will be here.
media in the workroom. Uh, we've just been told that um, Loyola has left its locker room and and route to the interview room. So if you want to cover uh, the Ramblers, they will be here shortly. Okay, we are now joined by the um, Loyola Chicago Ramblers, our student athletes. We have four today, um, no particular order, Lucas Williamson, Clayton Custer, Andre Jackson, and uh, Cameron Crutwig. Let's go to questions for any of the four. First one will be toward the back here on the right. Shannon Ryan, Chicago Tribune. Clayton, you mentioned last night um, the three-pointer. I think a little bit tongue-in-cheek said, you know, this is just because Ben always knows where I am or something like yeah. that. But I'm curious, just the, you guys obviously have gone back way through your childhood, but just what is the chemistry you have and are there some moments where you do just feel like there's some connection out there that you can't explain? Yeah, I mean, uh, we've, we've talked about it a lot. We joke about it in the room, but uh, a lot of times when I come off pick and rolls and stuff, like I won't really be able to see him because there will be people between us and stuff, but I just know he's back there somewhere, so I'll just throw it over my head, over the defenders to him and stuff. And um, It's just situations like that. I think we do such a good job of feeding off each other. Um, I think it's kind of um, people feed off our energy when, we, when we're playing well together, sharing the ball. Um, it, it's kind of everybody kind of starts doing the same thing, and um, we're able to get the ball moving, spacing it, uh, one mores. Um, and people feed off that energy. And uh, me and Ben have been doing that for our whole lives. Okay, we'll move to the left. Wendell Barnhouse with The Athletic for Clayton. Um, does coach have like a 24-hour rule or whatever as far as after a game to say, okay, if you win, celebrate for 24 and then forget about it? And I assume now maybe it's more like 12. And what's the... What's it been like since the end of the game? Did you look at the shot a lot? Uh, is it something that it's been kind of hard to, you know, not spend a lot of time looking at it or getting away from it? Uh, yeah, Co Coach does a really good job of uh, keeping us focused. So last night he wanted us to enjoy it. He wanted us to enjoy uh, the moment because uh, he knows that. I mean, that's a, that's something that we all have, have looked forward to our whole lives for a moment like that. So, um, but last night we 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 sat down. We got we got in the film room and we were watching some film um, just so that we could kind of stop thinking about the past and kind of move forward towards Tennessee. Um, and then now that we woke up today, I mean, I think. We're, we're kind of done celebrating yesterday. We're, we're, we've moved on, and, and now we're ready to go uh, to, try to try to beat Tennessee tomorrow. You're toward the front on the right. Skyler Dixon with the AP. Clayton and Andre, I think that you guys might be able to help me with this. I'll start with you, Clayton. Have you studied the history of Loyola enough to consider whether the 1963 championship team was maybe the first Cinderella that the NCAA ever had? Um, I mean, uh, the 1963 team did a lot more than, I mean, they transcended the game. I mean, they, they were the first team to start um, for African-American players. And um, Glory Road gets a lot of the, the, the movie, the Texas Western team gets a lot of the um, popularity or whatever that everybody knows about that. But a lot of people don't know about the 1963 team. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess in a way that it was a Cinderella, but I mean, that team was really talented. They, they had a lot of really good players. Um, but I think more than that, it was just amazing that uh, 
Coach Ireland uh, re recruited all those guys and brought them all to, to Rogers Park. And um, that, that team is an inspiration to us. Um, and we definitely know about the, the, the history of Loyola basketball. We, we've spent time with the 1963 team. Um, they, they come to our games. They're at our last home game this year. Um, and they've told us all the stories from, from back, back when they played. Um, so, I mean, they're a really good team and they're an inspiration to us for sure. Anyone, Andre? Same as him. <laughs> he said, ain't covered it all. <laughs> okay, let's go on the uh, left side toward the back. David Hoff, Chicago Tribune. Uh, Andre and Clayton, as older guys who were recruited at your, after your first stop coming out of high school, how would you describe Porter as, as far as a, a recruiter and with his pitch to you, and what stood out about him in the way that he kind of presented it to you? Um, I say his vision. Uh, he kept on preaching culture, kept on preaching family, uh, just the direction that the program was going. Uh, he's an honest person, so he never told me that I'll have it cookie cutter. He always told me I had to work for where I'm going to get, work for my spots and all that. So just that honesty and then the culture aspect and the family preaching has just helped me get here. Yeah, um, like what Dre said. Uh, I don't know, it's just his passion and his energy uh, is the first thing that you notice with, with Coach Mosier. He, uh, he always brings it every single day. And even when he first, the first time I ever actually talked to him in person, um, he actually came out to Ames after I had decided to transfer from Iowa State. Um, and I got to eat lunch with him. And you could just see it in his eyes how much he really cares about um, this program and how much he really wants to be great. Um, and that was the first thing that stuck out to me. Um, he's definitely a really, like, you can see, and I think that's why he's been able to get a lot of good players into this program. And he's a really good recruiter because, I mean, you can just see how much he really cares about it. Um, and then also, um, I don't know, the culture part is a big part. Um, you want to be around good guys. You know he's going to recruit character guys. So um, you know it's going to be a program where you're going to fit in and, and feel comfortable. Toward the back on the right. Right over here for Clayton and whoever else wants to answer. Whether you win by 26 like Tennessee did or you hit a buzzer beater, does any of that matter come tomorrow night or, or does it? Clayton? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think it matters now. I mean, we, we both got a W and uh, now we're moving on to the next one. Um, I think we, we can play better than we played yesterday. Um, so I, I think that's a good thing. We kind of got that first game under our belt now. Now we feel a little bit more comfortable um, just playing on the court, the field, the ball, all that stuff. Um, I think we'll feel more comfortable out there sh shooting and shooting and everything. So um, I don't think it matters how much we won by. I think I think we're going to get on the scouting report and do whatever we can to try to get a win tomorrow. Who else wants to take that? Maybe uh, Cameron? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't think it really uh, matters. Obviously, you know, they won by a large margin of victory. And, uh, you know, we, we won that last second shot. But, you know, we're just going into tomorrow, you know, playing like we played against Miami. Obviously, you know, we're not going to, you know, uh, lay down for them. We're not going to be, you know, shocked because they're, you know, they play in a better conference or, you know, they're, they're high major or anything like that. You know, we respect them and hopefully they respect us, too. And, uh, you know, we're just going to go out there and play like we normally play. And uh, you know, once that ball gets tipped up, you know, we're we're just gonna we're just gonna play hard and, and uh, set the tone with them. So, let's move back to the left. Andre Wendell Barnhouse from the Athletic. Um, after Tennessee's game, I talked to one of the Wright State players or top scorers about Tennessee's defense, and he said, you know, they got a lot of long, quick, big guys, which a lot of teams have, but they really get after it defensively. That's what he said. That that was kind of sets them apart. And they're one of the best defensive teams in the country, according to Ken Palm. Is that, is that something that you can really see from film or until you guys get on the floor tomorrow? Is that going to be something that, uh, you know, you may have to kind of adjust to during the game, depending on how they come after you all? Uh, we used to playing against size, but um, when we was watching film earlier, they try to block shots. So just a lot of pump fakes, a lot of eyes to the rim, and we'll get them out of stance and out of position, and then it'll be easier for us to score. Hey guys, on your right. Henry Redmond, Loyola Phoenix, Sir Clay and Andre, you guys have been here a couple years and you've played in front of genteel crowds that there weren't that many people, but I'm sure you saw the video of Damon yesterday. So what's it like seeing the buzz around your team grow on campus? Clayton, we'll let you go. All right. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's been the cool, one of the really cool parts about um, being a part of this team this year is that we've kind of created that buzz around uh, the university and around campus um, and around 
all the whole community. Um, they've started to come out and support us, um, especially towards the end of the year. We were starting to get big crowds at Gentile, and um, to see those videos of like of 63 and Damon and Schreiber downtown and uh, the Bulldog, like everybody was in there and they were going crazy when we won. So, um, I mean, I think everybody, every a part of every college experience, everybody wants to be a part of that. I mean, it, it's something cool that you, it's something that. Um, you, we've seen growing up, they, they pan to the university and everybody's going crazy on campus. And um, we got to experience that yesterday and, and it was really cool. Andre, you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a great feeling. Uh, seeing after we beat Florida, we got a little bit of buzz, but as long as, I mean, as we kept on winning and winning our conference, winning the conference tournament, like the fan base increased. And then winning the game yesterday was amazing. It was a lot of videos on Twitter uh, about people that wasn't even in Chicago, like Las Vegas people that was watching the game and everybody just screaming and yelling after a great shot. So yeah, it's just nice to have a good fan base. We'll move further back here on the outside on the right. Chuck Carlton, Dallas Morning News. For, for Clayton, could you just kind of reflect on your path from growing up, you know, Kansas household outside Kansas City in Overland Park to that year at Iowa State and then finding your way to Loyola? How did all that unfold? Yeah, um, so I grew up in Overland Park, Kansas, um, and I played with Ben. We went to Blue Valley Northwest, and um, I started to get recruited in high school, and it was mainly like by a few Big 12 schools. I, I ended up deciding to go to Iowa State um, at the beginning of my junior year. Um, and then when I ended up getting there, I enjoyed the experience a lot. It was, it was fun being there. And um, I'm glad I, I spent that year there. It was, it was a good experience for me. Um, but I mean, it just didn't work out. And, and that's kind of how sometimes this, this works in this business and stuff like that. So um, I have no hard feelings towards them at all. It just wasn't the right situation for me. Um, so I decided to make make the make the move, and um, when I decided to transfer, it's it's obviously kind of a scary situation because you don't know who, what your options are going to be and and who's going to give you another opportunity. And um, Coach Mosier and uh, Coach Gordon were two of the first coaches to call me right right when I got my release, um, and that meant a lot to me that they that they were really serious about giving me another opportunity. And uh, like I said, Coach Moser came out to Ames actually to eat lunch with me, which was which was awesome. Um, and he actually went to see my family too in, in Overland Park. So um, that was right off the bat. Um, I I kind of knew that that me and Mosher were going to coach Mosher were going to get get have a good relationship. And um, then also add in having my best friend from high school um, on the team as well, um, and having the opportunity to play with him again um, in college. Not a lot of best friends get to play Division One basketball together. So uh, I thought it was too good of an opportunity to pass up. Hey guys, we'll go back to the left. Cameron and, and Lucas, as, as younger guys, what was your first impression of uh, Coach Moser's style, hands-on style, and how aggressively he does coach all the time? Lucas, why don't we let you go first? Well, um, when I first got here, the first thing that I really noticed was his energy and his passion. And um, the way that he coaches is something that I'm kind of used to, um, coming from Chicago and the way of the style that we play at Chicago. Um, <clears throat> So it wasn't really hard to, to get accustomed. It was just the speed and how everything, he wanted everything to be so detailed. And um, I think that's really helped me throughout the year. And Clayton? Oh, he said who? OK. Me? OK. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, one of the main things that, that lured me to Loyola was, was just, you know, when I came down for visits and things like that, just kind of the family that, you know, that he preached and, and you know, all these guys just being great friends. and. You know that that culture that we always talk about. You know, and uh, he just kind of introduced me to it. And uh, you know, in high school, I, I came from a, a program like that where we had a lot of culture and we did things the right way. And uh, you know, at Loyal, obviously, we we do things the right way. And uh, you know, coach was always telling me that you know he had a vision for me and that uh, you know if I if I came to Loyola, you know, we could do some big things. And uh, you know, with these guys, we got a lot of pieces. And uh, you know, I just like the guys a lot and uh, coach's vision. And uh, you know, obviously, it all it, it all worked out. So. Hey, back on the right. Lucas, how has your state championship experience helped in these big moments as a freshman? Um, I think uh, just that path, that whole state championship like run has really helped uh, because of, you know, I kind of got used to, okay, 
win a game, put it in the bank, <clears throat> focus on the next opponent. And uh, that, like, next opponent, next next game mentality is something that we've really bought into all year, and uh, especially postseason um, and Arch Madness and, and March Madness. Any other questions? No? All right. We'll let you guys head back and get ready for practice. Thanks for coming. Thank you. And we are now uh, joined by Coach Mosier. Coach, um, what has it been, 24 hours, something like that, since the big shot? Well, what's your thoughts going into tomorrow? You know, our thoughts have uh, been about Tennessee and uh, how big and physical they are, how, how much, uh, how balanced they are. They got size, they got speed, they got shooters, and they're well coached. So, our, you know, we. You had I, I, the guys really enjoyed the moment last night. Um, it was great here that we leave in the arena. We got back. We kind of just decompressed with a team meal um, with each other, and then and then our coaches went to work. We let them get some rest, and we went to work and got our minds focused on Tennessee. Questions now for coach. We'll go here on the left first. Wendell Barnhouse from the Athletic Porter. In that situation, are you one of those coaches with kind of a 24-hour rule after victory where you say, hey, give them 24 until the next game? And obviously, this is a different situation with a different game. Was there any kind of a different approach to try to make sure that they kind of, like you said, enjoyed the moment, but then kind of start resetting to play Tennessee? Yeah, like if it was a regular season game where you know you're not playing the next day, we have a 24-hour, you know, we're just kind of – you let them, but like last week at Arch Madness and the, and the thing, you know, you got to get moving the next, you play the next day. Now for this, we were this kind of the same thing, you know, is you can't prepare yourself, especially at Loyola for the national scope of what happened last night. You know, these guys are back in their hotel room watching themselves all night. The, the social media was berserk. Um, and I'm one of those guys where I wanted them to enjoy the moment. I mean, this is how hard they've worked for. And I can do that because this is, I said this yesterday or two days ago, it's a mature group. You know, we, then we went back talking about their personnel, Tennessee's personnel. This morning we had some meetings, some film. And they, every time that we, it's time to do business and do that, this group is completely locked in. So, you know, we, we, we decompressed at the hotel a little bit with a team meal last night. And uh, our coaches, we went right at it. We went right back and moved, moved forward, put it in the bank, and now our thoughts are to Tennessee. On the left. David Hawk, Chicago Tribune. Porter, so this moment and everything that comes with winning an NCAA game the way that you did and just winning it, period. When you were a 31-year-old head coach, Division One program in Arkansas Little Rock, did you think it would be easier to or come sooner? And, and do you look back at that guy at that time and, and you know think, boy, you've come a long way? Or is this – how do you reflect on that? You know, I, I haven't really thought about that that long of a journey. I've just, I've just thought about the – you know, I've taken over rebuilds, you know, complete rebuilds. And um, this rebuild at Loyola has been a grassroots rebuild. And, um, you know, I just, I really haven't reflected on that, David. I've just reflected on, you know, how far and how great it is for the university, how, how what kind of group I have. I mean, I'm listening to the press conference with Dante Ingram. And to, I mean, I, I know this because I know how good a guys these are. But he, you know, he makes a comment about you know any one of those guys in the locker room could have hit that shot. You know, I was just fortunate enough to be the one Marcus passed to. I mean, what a humble, great thing to say for a 21, 22 year old in that moment right there. That's who they are. They share the ball. They're humble. They're high quality kids. We got an unbelievable parental support system. Our parents of these young men are first class. And I was reflecting on, I'm I'm blessed to go through this journey 
with the guys in our locker room. And I said that early, like first week of the season. And now we're here. And that's what I was reflected on. Toward the back on the right. Uh, Kirk Bowles from the Austin American Statesman. Uh, uh, Coach, are y'all still the official darlings of the <laughs> NCAA tournament or is Buffalo trying no. to steal your thunder? Damn Nate Oates and Buffalo. I, <laughs> I, I said that on the uh, Golick show this morning. I'm like, gosh darn it. Um, I was happy for them. I was happy for them. But it was, you know, it, it is um, truly, you, you, you don't try to think about that. You, you don't. I mean, it's fun to joke with it, but our, we've, you know, I heard Lucas say the term, I love when players regurgitate what you tell them. You know, we've been talking about put it in the bank, put it in the bank. Because we've been doing that for a while now, because we've had to, um, especially, you know, when we were on that proverbial bubble, which we really weren't on the bubble. But, you're, you know, put it in the bank. And that's what our guys said last night. They, you know, we, we got that one. Now we got to move on. And um, they, they, they didn't, they look at, they're looking at it like we're still chasing. We're really chasing for another one. But do you believe in destiny? Sure. Why not? Why, why not? Why not believe in it? And, and, and uh, you know, we've all watched the tournament. It's, it's crazy stuff happens, March Madness. Um, but it just doesn't happen by daydreaming about it. You're not going to compete against Tennessee just daydreaming about it. I mean, you're going to have to play physical. You're going to have to box out every possession. You're going to have to guard the post because they have some of the best duck-in players in the country. We've got we've our, our hands full on things we've got to prepare for yourself. I think people that just think and daydream about destiny and all this, it becomes fantasizing. There's a lot of things we've got to get ready into this game plan and then and produce and do in this game to compete with Tennessee. Again on the right. Chuck Carlton, Dallas Morning News. Uh, Porter, Clayton talked about when he had decided to transfer from Iowa State, you visiting him, having lunch, that sort of thing. Uh, he hadn't played a whole lot that freshman year, but what did you see in him, and, and did you envision the kind of upside that, that he's displayed at uh, Loyola? Yeah, 100%. Um, I would seen him in high school uh, when I recruited Ben Richardson, and just I love their program, you know, where they come from. They won two state championships together. They were – I just – I saw how character – so I saw him, you know, play and in the program he came from and win as, as we had signed Ben. And then when he became available, I remember right away, we got his release and it was game on. You know, we, there, was, there was, I don't know if I've ever put, I mean, it was the foot on the gas pedal. We envisioned him having this kind of impact on us. I mean, that's the kind of player that, that, we, that I saw um, in high school and I saw with Ben. And uh, it's been really cool to watch those two. Um, like, like he said, you don't get to really have your best friend play this level with it. And then it's really cool. Now go on the left. Wendell Barnell, the Athletic Porter. Uh, I talked with uh, Grant Benzinger, the leading scorer for Wright State after they lost to Tennessee. He talked about the fact that they're so long, they're quick, um, you know, they've got all the physical attributes, and a lot of teams have that. But defensively, they just get after it, and a lot of teams don't do that. From watching them on film, what do you think of them defensively? And it will, will it be something could, you can really tell from film or until the guys get out there and realize how strong and physical and quick these guys are? Is that going to be maybe a bit of an adjustment? Well, we've, uh, they do get after it. Tennessee does. They, they, they contest every shot. They really do. They do not want you to get easy shots. They really, they're long. Um, their guards are put together. I mean, they're, they're really a physical team. And, uh, you know, we've played big teams in Florida and Miami. Um, so the size, um, these guys have, you know, Dante and Ben has had three years of Wichita State, which is, which is a ton of size. Um, so they've seen it, um, but you make a great observation. They, they, they've been really at a high level on both ends. You know, they're efficient. They don't beat themselves. Um, they're efficient on both ends, and um, there's a reason why they're that good. And um, but we've you, you really I think the thing that really impresses me is how fundamental Williams is posting up. I mean, he is the best duck in guy in the country. You show me a better guy that ducks in, and in, in the words of Rick Majerus, makes and maintains contact. Like he he makes and maintains contact as good as anybody when he ducks in. And I've just been really impressed with. Uh, with, with, with how, that is fundamental in, in ducking in and posting up. 
All the way in the back now. Uh, Andy Staples, Sports Illustrated. With, with Clayton and Ben, what is it like coaching guys that have played together since third grade? Do you have to say anything to them sometimes? Can they communicate without speaking? They've been, they, they, you know, you can, you can get on them. You know when, to, you know, they just, they get it. Um, but I'll share with you what, when you ask me what it's like to coach them, I'm going to tell you a story that happened last week at, at uh, the Missouri Valley Tournament. We won the game, uh, the final game, so we're going to the NCAA Tournament. We had an hour-long celebration on the court. Then we had to go to the locker room. We had five minutes to just our team. We said a prayer, talked, and then we had to go to the press conference. So we're walking to the press conference, and I'm walking behind them. And it was the coolest moment. They both had their, their hats on, Valley Championships. They had nets coming out of the side. And they're just walking next to each other with, like, arms around. He goes, man, can you believe this? We've won since we were in third grade. Because, man, they're just hitting each other back and forth going, can you believe this? We won state championships. Now we're going to the tournament. It was the, the most genuine little kid moment of two grown guys just sharing it like, man, we've been winning our whole lives. And it, I, I was walking behind him just going, man, I'm blessed to coach these two. And they're winners on and off the floor. And um, it's been really cool to coach them. We'll stay on coaches, right? Henry Redmond, Loyola Phoenix. Coach, what are you going to need out of Crowick and Andre tomorrow to go up against Tennessee's big men? 15 rebounds apiece. That's what I'm asking. Um, they're, they're, they're rebounding. You know, we just we don't see it from four out of the five guys. Like, they, they crash four guys. I mean, we were pushing the pause button. You were seeing they box out on the offensive side. I mean, they box out to get the offensive rebound. So we're going to need a, a tremendous effort on the glass. We're going to have to have a tremendous effort post-defensive-wise. They pound it inside. They duck you in. Um, you got to do your work early in the post. You just can't sit there and let them just post you up. So we're going to have to have the best rebounding and post-defensive effort of the year uh, tomorrow. Coach is left in the middle. Before Rick Majerus, who were your greatest coaching influences? And have you ever uh, had to temper your hands-on style, either during a game or practice, just, be, just to gather your, regather your poise? Well, my, my, another one of my biggest mentors in my life is my college coach and who brought me into this profession was Tony Baroni. Chicago guy, he was my college coach at Creighton. I coached with him six years at Texas A&M. Um, he was high energy as you can get, passionate. Um, and, you know, I spent, you know, 10 years with him. And, uh, you know, he left me a message. He was at our game when we clinched the, or when we won the Missouri Valley Championship at home when we got presented the trophy. He lives right near Loyola campus. Still a huge influence in my life. But uh, no question, Tony Brony was... Uh, uh, a huge mentor of mine. Let's move back to the right, toward the back. Skyler Dixon with the AP. Order, have you studied history enough to have an opinion on whether Loyola was the first Cinderella uh, in the 1963 championship season? The first Cinderella? No, you know, I, I've studied history to know about the, the, all the, the game of change and the four African-American starters, but the first I would have to guess no if you're asking me, because there must be another Cinderella um, with there. Was there? I would argue they might have been. If you look at the, you know, if you look at the list, you, you might be able to make the argument. I don't know. Well, it's an interesting question. It is, because you know, I, I, you, know you, look at, you look at all the t programs that won national championships. You know, there's not, I don't think there's more than 40, uh, if someone knows the exact number. But you know, Loyola Chicago sticks out. Like, Loyola Chicago won one? So that year. That year was such a, a monumental breakthrough for so many things. I guess I've never, I, I've always looked at that as so much more of a, a breaking segregation, the game of change, that I really haven't thought about them being a Cinderella because it was Loyola Chicago. So it is, it is interesting to think like that. But that team is uh, obviously means a lot to, to us and to um, what it was all about back then in the game of change. Uh, that just very quickly, that another thing I wonder about is if the term Cinderella based on the social implications just kind of cheapens the whole thing because of what we think of Cinderella today. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, in the back. Uh, Coach, can you uh, kind of trace your recruiting of Andre Jackson? Is he just a guy that slipped through the cracks for other Power Five schools? Yeah, you know what, um, is I love guys that are efficient and get it done. He's a get it done guy. I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't bother, he's an undersized guy. I've had a lot of, I've had 
like three all league players that are undersized. I had Montel James, 6'6, six, six, was all league. Christian Thomas was 6'5, and now Andre Jackson, 6'5. You know, I think sometimes coaches get into that mode where they hear the, the, they hear the voices from outside, whether it's fan bases and recruiting services, and, you know, God, we need a big, we need a big. He's a two star, he's a three star. And, you know, none of that matters. And, I, I, you know, there's a lot of guys that'll take, well, we need this 6'9 guy, and the 6'9 guy can't do anything. Andre was second in the nation in field goal percentage. He, in, in, and that's a, that's a stat that translates, you know, your field goal percentage. He was shot like 64% at junior college on a team that went to Hutchinson, Kansas. I watched him play there a couple games against a team that had like four or five high major guys, and he had 26 points. He had a knack to scoring the ball against bigger guys. And when we signed him last year, he was top three in the country in Division I in field goal percentage. It translated right to Division I, that field goal percentage. So I love get it done guys, you know, and I, you know, when we watched him. So 6'5 post players scared a lot of people off. You know, I don't, it doesn't bother me. I mean, he, I, I like get it done guys, and he's one of them. Um, a lot of schools that were, you know, at our level. I mean, it, we, there wasn't a high major school on them. And um, it was a lot of schools at our level um, um, recruiting them. All the way back now? Uh, yeah, Coach, TJ Mahoney, uh, Turner Sports. Um, years ago, when I was at Marquette, I had the uh, good fortune to interview uh, Rick Majerus. Um, he was nice enough to give me time to, to help me with a, um, a journalism project I had. And uh, I'll never forget him telling me one of the biggest challenges when it came to recruiting was keeping kids, whether it was kids from Milwaukee or wherever, keeping kids from the city, in the city, or, or, or getting them to come to Marquette, a city campus. How tough is it getting kids from Chicago to stay in Chicago? When I got the job seven years ago at Loyola, we're Loyola of Chicago, we had one Illinois player on the roster. And we had not one Chicago Public League player in a 10 or 12 year window. That's amazing to me. Think about that. It was, it was probably a, David Bailey was the last. It was like 11 or 12 years. And we convinced Milton Doyle, who was a highly ranked player from Chicago, to come. And he kind of, everybody knew Milton in the city, outstanding first team All State player. And I think people were like, and if you ask Dante, he said the same thing. Well, Milton went there. I'll check it out. And we had to grassroots recruit coaches, parents to come to our campus. Our campus is absolutely gorgeous on the lake. And it is, I mean, they've put so much money in redoing it. And we had so many people from Chicago, myself included, that when they got in and walked our campus, they said, I had no idea this was here, tucked up on the north side. So we started to just bring grassroots bringing people. Then we got Dante, then we got Lucas Williamson, and it started with Milt. And I think young people, they, they you know, it wasn't cool to go to Loyola. I mean, they hadn't been winning. You know, they hadn't been on campus to see it. The people that advised them haven't been on campus to see it. So we had to really grassroots the whole thing. And I think people are seeing now, hey, you know what? Milton Doyle graduated, you know, and got a great degree. And his friends and family saw him play a ton. You look at Dante Ingram. He's going to graduate in a couple months with a great degree from Loyola of Chicago. Dante has an entourage at all the games all the games. And I think it's becoming something where, you know, I think staying home now and playing in front of family and friends, because at times people will say, man, I wanna get away, I wanna get away. We're in a great part of, we're right on the lake, tucked in, we got a campus feel, we got 6,000 students live on our campus. It's a great setup. It's a setup I think we can really snowball into bigger and better things. And I think more and more kids in Chicago are looking at Milton Doyle, Dante Ingram, Lucas Williamson, and looking at, you know what? I can stay home, get a great degree, and have friends and family see us. And now they can add the piece. We're in a great conference, and we have the ability to win that conference. No comment. <laughs> hey, Coach, we'll go on your right, outside aisle. Porter, for years you've been going to freshman orientations yeah. and begging students to come to games. What's it like seeing the celebrations in Damon and all the student centers and the bars around Chicago and seeing all that work pay off? Absolutely awesome. To, to watch, I, you know, what he's referring to is I, the freshmen have an orientation and they break it off into six groups throughout the summer. And I'd run over there between my basketball camp and speak to all the friends and family and beg them to come to games. And I've been doing that for years. And, 
to see that aerial view of Damon Student Center last night gave me chills. Um, it was just nuts. I mean, they had a celebration at the business school, at the student center, at Ireland's, at all around. They had student athletes. I saw the softball team. I saw the track team all having watch parties. Just that's what you want. That's what you want in a student body. I told it can help their experience getting behind it. And I thought um, it meant it meant so much because of the efforts I've put in to connect with the students and to get them to buy in to see their excitement over our run meant a lot. Other questions for Coach? I think not. Okay, Coach. Thank you. We'll let you head to practice. Thank you for Thank coming. You. Good luck tomorrow.
Good. How you doing? Okay. Yeah, we can cheat them over. Okay, we'll just cheat them over just a tiny bit. Media in the workroom, just a heads up, uh, Texas Tech is scheduled to be in the room in about four minutes. About four minutes. Four minutes. Mm -hmm. As we await the arrival of the Red Raiders in the interview room, um, we'll go over our list of demands again. Silent cell phones, please. No flash photography and then no video of any kind in the room. Transcripts can be found at ncaa.com slash transcripts. Satellite coordinates again are Galaxy 17 KU band 
Transponder 17C, 12044.5 horizontal, the symbol rate is 7.2, and the FEC is 5 over 6. And we've just been told that Texas Tech has left its locker room. Uh, Tex left the locker room. They're heading this way.
Okay, we're ready to begin with the uh, Red Raiders from Texas Tech. Uh, our student athletes are Tommy Hamilton, Keenan Evans, Jarrett Culver, and Narenz Odiaste. Questions for any of the four? Again, please uh, state name and affiliation when you ask your question. Guys, we'll go on your right toward the back. Josh Peter with USA Today for Keenan. Uh, I was hoping you can talk about your journey over these four years, how important it is to be here and uh, how special it be to advance? Um, this journey has meant everything to me. Um, like I say in every interview, you know, just being at the, you know, the bottom of Tech basketball and now being at one of the highest points and being a part of a team that can pretty much make history is, you know, unbelievable. Hey, here on the uh, front row on your left. Will McKay with Red Raider Sports. Uh, I guess for, for any of you guys, how do you feel like just getting through the first game, just kind of you know feeling through your emotions and uh, just getting that first win. How important do you think that is? Just so you can kind of after you, you get the first one, you just say, "All right, we're in it." Now we can just kind of roll through it at this point. Um, Tommy, you want to go first? That that first one felt good, man. That was my first tournament game, and it was my first taste of it to see what it's like. Um, it was ugly, but we got it done, and. I think that we're aware that, you know, most of the games like this tournament is going to be like that. So we're preparing to come out and play our best game tomorrow, and I think we'll be ready. Okay, let's move back over to the right. Stephen Hawkins with the AP, and maybe Jared and Lorenz on this. Just when, when you see Keenan, I mean, obviously he has nights like last night where he 0 for 4 in the first half, and, you know, then he comes back in the second half, and I know he's done that several times this year. Just talk about – you know that he's going to come through, but and, and what was it like those few games that you guys were without him this year? Uh, we just trust Keenan a lot, so we put the ball in his hands a lot at the end, and he comes through a lot this season. So just trusting him at the end to do what he does, um, he's proven us that he can be trusted. And two games without him, we knew we was going to have to play hard, and we just did our best to try to win those games. Lawrence? Uh, just like he says, uh, we trust him, put the ball in his hands. He makes plays all year long. Uh, those games without him, obviously, we struggled, but it's glad to have him 100% now. So, okay, here on the left, yep. Joe Yeager inside the Red Raiders, and just any of you guys can take this, all of you, if you want. But um, how much more intense was that game last night than the stuff that you normally play in the Big 12, if any, or was it, or was it about the same? What was it like? You say you want all four. Just whoever wants okay, it. Whoever let's, start, wants it. let's start with Jared and then move down. I feel like it was very intense because if you lose, then your season's over. So we ain't, we want to keep going. And the first game is really tough. So we just played our hardest. And we knew if we lost, our season going to be over. And we didn't want that. Um, just being in the, a conference like the Big 12 kind of prepares you for those types of nights. And you know, tournament is kind of a different atmosphere. But being in the Big 12 prepared us so. We've been working at that, and we've been talking about finishing, and that's one of the big parts of that game last night was finishing at the end. Um, yeah, like like Keenan twelve. I mean, like Keenan said, playing in the Pick Twelve prepared us for games like last night, and I think also it was just a part of our identity that showed. Um, we've been down big um, at half some games this time, and came back and won, and you know been down with a minute to go, came back and won. So it was something that we've been doing. Uh, like they all said, uh, the Big 12 sets us up pretty well to be able to play in these games. Uh, just like Jared said, though, there's a little bit of added intensity just because it could be potentially our last game. So we just brought that to the table, and we wanted to play hard. Let's go in the back here on the right. Chuck Carlton, Dallas Morning News. For, for Keenan, just reflect on coming out of Richardson because you weren't the – you know, the typical four or five star recruit that everybody was after, but, you know, about the path that led you to Texas Tech. And when did you first realize that I've got a pretty high ceiling and I can make a lot of things happen out here? Um, just in high school, just putting in all the work, you know, not being really, you know, touted as a four or five star. It just motivates you every day. And I just feel like that's how this team is, you know, just with our name. We're not, you know, a, Kentucky or Kansas across our chest, and we have to go take everything we want. And so that's just been, you know, my motto all, all my life. It's just, you know, got to go take it instead of, you know, can't let it be handed to me. I just got to go get it. Hey, guys, on your left here on the inside aisle. Paul Tubbs, KLBK Lubbock. Guys, uh, just each one of you 
kind of talk about how important it is to get off to a quick start against a Florida team that uh, has a lot of depth to it, very tenacious on the defensive side, and to not kind of find yourself down three points going into the half. Do you say all four or just? Yes, anyone? all four. OK. Um, Jarrett, we'll start with you again. Uh, starting off the game is very important. Uh, just starting off strong and attacking and trying not to get down is very important for us. So it really sets the tone. Um, yeah, uh, last night we didn't get off to a good start, so this this game will be big for us to get off to a great start. We're kind of flinging the ball everywhere and just you know not doing what we practice, and so getting off to a great start is very important in this game. Um, it's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. <laughs> That's all I got. It's huge. Whenever you can get through the first game, uh, I guess some jitters are gone. We we know what we're used to. Uh, we're back in the tournament. We can kind of not relax, but kind of settle down into it. See what we did last game, what wrong, went wrong uh, to start that game, and just watch the film and see how we can get better for this game. Okay, on the right. Keenan, kind of take us through when you hurt your, I guess it was a toe, right, that you hurt the toe. Can, Talk about what that felt like and just how difficult was it for you to try to push through it and, and then what, where are you at right now with that? I mean, are you 100% or is it adrenaline or what now? Um, it was tough to to overcome just because I feel like I let my team down in a way, but, you know, I feel like it wasn't my fault. And also it's just not 100% yet, and I still, you know, battle with it every night. And, you know, just the support and confidence given from my teammates, you know, helped me make it through every night and, you know, the trainers, you know, staying up late and, you know, working throughout the day to just help me, you know, feel better is uh, greatly appreciated. So I'm definitely, you know, still working on, you know, getting to 100%. Have you hurt too much Uh, not really, not, not, not this bad. Okay, on your left. For Jarrett and Keenan specifically, with the way that Florida just, I mean, they kind of volume shoot threes, several of those guys do. No, you guys have played good three-point defense all year long, but I guess how maybe even in this game specifically is it so much more important to keep your rotations up and just be on everybody that's on the line outside? Jared? Uh, they're a great team. Uh, they're a great shooting team as well. So we just try to focus on trying to take that part away in a way. So just focusing on that and our defense turns into offense. So just making sure we take that away. Um, you know, in the tournament, they always talk about threes is what beats you. So we just got to be, uh, be more urgent getting out to that three-point line and you know, not foul them on three-point shots and just try to take away what they do best. Okay, in the back. Uh, Kirk Balls from the Austin American Statesman. Uh, Keenan, can you describe the mindset of maybe taking over a game like you really have in the second half? And per that, I don't know if you've watched the NCAA tournament, if you, you know, looked at other players that took over their team and great runs in the tournament. Um, it just in my mind it's like, you know, every night's a senior night for me, so I don't I don't wanna lose, I don't wanna go home yet and you know, as time ticks down, it's just like, you know, putting more pressure on yourself and it's like if we lose I feel like it's all on me, so I just, you know, try to do what I can. Uh, I saw I saw um some highlights I think with the Houston game, um the guy took over and it's just kinda, you know, Amazing to see other players do it too, and it kind of motivates you. Like you know, I want to be that guy for my team, and no matter where where that is, just on the defensive end or offensive end. Go back on the left, Jarrett. Just kind of talk about how surreal this experience has been for you, because this time last year you were finishing up with the Coronado Mustangs, and now you're sitting up there on the stage. How how, how exciting has this been for you? Well, it's a blessing to be here, most definitely. Um, I'm glad to be here with my team. We set a goal from day one since we started, so it's glad to see that we're here and we made March Madness, and we're just trying to do something in it. Okay, toward the back here on the right. Uh, Newey Scruggs, NBC5 Dallas. Um, per, per Keenan, any of the guys here, um, the feeling of the crowd last night, um, because it was packed with just two Texas, uh, two Texas teams, and just the crowd was the same, cheering for both. And then, just what are you expecting tomorrow as you guys uh, get back out again here? I'm expecting, you know, even more fans tomorrow, just because it's a Saturday and it's at a pretty good time. So, uh, just Raider Nation, I'm hoping they show up and you know show out and you know help us come out with the win. 
Tom, you want to answer that as well? Um, same as Keenan said, um, it was a great atmosphere. It was a fun to be a part of, and we kind of knew it was going to be a lot of people here um, since we we're not that far from school, and the alumni base is huge in Dallas. So we hope to see you guys even more tomorrow. Other questions for any of our student athletes? Okay, I think we're done. I'll let you um, head back to the locker room with your SID, Matt Dunaway. Thanks for coming, guys, and um, good luck tomorrow. Coach Beard will be on stage in about five minutes. All right, well, we'll continue on with the Red Raiders now and head coach Chris Beard. Coach, we'll call on your, you first for your thoughts um, um, 
after practice and going into tomorrow. Just uh, pleased to advance. You know, really proud of our players. Um, you work so hard. These games are so hard to win. They really don't define a season. A lot of really good basketball teams, championship basketball teams, will leave this tournament, you know, at some point. Uh, but for us, it's just a deal where we want to just try to live another day. It's a team that really enjoys being around each other and practicing games. And so we just feel fortunate to, you know, advance to the second round. Um, our respect for Florida and their program and their coach couldn't be any higher. Uh, this is one of the best offensive teams in college basketball with a three-point shooting. Uh, a really good defensive team that gets a lot of steals and turns you over. Um, and a coach that's one of the best uh, coaches in college basketball. His teams play hard. They don't beat themselves. Um, I think they've been to the Elite Eight like the last four or five times they've been in this tournament. So um, they have our full respect and full attention. From our standpoint, we think we're going to have to play the best game of the season tomorrow. Uh, that's our approach, uh, and that's our objective. All right, questions now for Coach. Coach is left on the front. Coach, could you just speak more to Florida and the way they just kind of volume shoot it with, with several of those guys from behind three? I know you guys obviously have been good from with three-point defense all year, but maybe have this game maybe one of the most important ones for you guys as far as three-point defense. Yeah, every team in this tournament has a different offensive identity. Um, and I think it'd be safe to say that one of the big parts of Florida's offense is the three-point shot, both in transition and in the half court. And so, you know, that's going to be a lot of work for us. You got to kind of pick your poison if you try to take away the three-point line. You open yourself up for drives or inside play. Um, but if you sag back, there's certainly a team that can beat you with that one weapon. So uh, that's something we got to figure out. You know, I don't, I don't have the answer right now, but I just got to have it by tomorrow evening. Let's stay on the left side of the room here on the aisle. Uh, Coach, uh, could you talk a little bit about Davide's game last night um, and considering the, the pressure of the situation and the, 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 I don't know, the, size, the size of the stage, um, did it look to you like maybe he's beginning to come of age a little bit with those two big shots and just generally playing a pretty solid game? Yeah, we really like Morrow in our uh, program. We think he's going to be a great player. Um, highly recruited guy, took some visits to other BCS schools. I think on our team, Jarrett Culver and Zaire Smith have gotten a lot of attention this year for having outstanding freshman years, which they should. Uh, Culver's a great young talent as well as Z. Uh, but I'd put Morrow in that same class. He's just a guy that's kind of waiting his opportunity. Uh, coming from Italy and being an international player, he played for his national team this summer, which did not allow him to come to Lubbock for off-season workouts in the summer and conditioning. So the first day that he ever played was basically on the first day of school. And he just took a huge adjustment to get used to the athleticism and the physicality of co college basketball versus international. So he's just been trying to keep up. Um, but we've always had a lot of confidence in his talent, his game, his basketball IQ. He's made some big plays for us this year. Uh, he's won four or five Big 12 games himself with key plays he made down the stretch. So it was nice to see yesterday all his hard work and all the confidence that we have in him within our program, you know, help us win a tournament game yesterday. Uh, but I, I think Morrow is going to be a special player. We'll move to Coach Beard's right. Wendell Barnhouse from The Athletic. Chris, when you got to Texas Tech, you had a point guard in Keenan who was going into his junior year. Can you kind of explain how he's developed his game and developed as a player to become the guy that you guys kind of look for to close out games? Yeah, absolutely. I think the first thing you got to recognize is Coach Tubby Smith and his staff uh, recruiting Keenan, uh, investing time in him as a freshman and, uh, when they didn't have the best of records, but Tubby had a plan. And Justin and Zach and Norrence and Keenan were getting playing time. As a sophomore, Keenan's the starting point guard on an NCAA tournament team, the first tournament team at Texas Tech in over a decade uh, since Coach Knight was the coach and I was there with him. Um, and then I think you got to give our staff some credit uh, for putting him in situations where offensively we're uh, a lot of confidence in him, allowed him to do things, expanded his game a little bit. Um, but then above all, thirdly and above all, not even close, you got to give Keenan all the credit. The Keenan Evans story isn't me or Tubby, it's Keenan Evans. This guy has self-made himself into one of the best players in college basketball. And I can tell you how he's done it. He's done it with a lot of work. He's in the gym every day. He's in the film room a lot. Uh, he's a guy that's cha you know, changed his body in the weight room. To me, he's everything good about college basketball. When you think about four-year players staying and grinding, uh, and I think Keenan will play in the NBA. The courage he's shown here in the last month with the toe issue to still play at this level, 
uh, and the kind of pain he's in. You know, I, I've never coached in the NBA, but I, I know those guys look for the intangibles. And uh, that guy's middle name is intangible. You know, I've never coached a tougher guy uh, than Keenan Evans. If I could just follow up with that. Uh, from a baseball analogy, is he kind of like Mariano Rivera for you guys as far as at the end of a close game, you put the ball in his hands, he finds a way to either get fouled or finish at the basket. And those finishes he makes look easy, but those aren't easy plays he's, he's making, right? Yeah, he's a special player. Um, you know, we kind of take what the game brings to us in terms of finishing. Uh, there's different ways we can go, but certainly Keenan is our point guard, our leader. Uh, and he has the courage to make those plays in those moments. He wants the ball late. Uh, he's earned the right to be in those moments throughout his career, the ups and downs. Um, so certainly, yeah, he's one of our better players, and we absolutely want him involved late in games. Stream left now. Stephen Hawkins with the AP. Just two quick questions about Keenan. The first one, just how different was this team during that stretch to when he was really hurt? I mean, when he hurt the toe at Baylor and then, you know, the next two games he really wasn't himself and then that third game he didn't play. And then I'll follow up after you do that. In my personal opinion, uh, a little bit's been too made of that. I mean, we're playing in the Big 12 Conference uh, and we're, we're on the road at West Virginia and at Baylor. And then we've got Kansas. Y'all might have heard of them. Uh, we got them at home. So I think the relationship between Keenan being out for a little bit and resting a little bit and us, you know, dropping a couple games. Obviously, that's a factor, but you also got to consider the other factors. Um, you know, that stretch also allowed us to learn some things about our team. Other players were given more minutes and, and opportunity, and I think that will only pay dividends. It played dividends yesterday, uh, seeing Morrow and Naeem and Brandon Francis make big plays down the stretch. Um, so there's no question that's affected our team, but, you know, everybody in this tournament is affected by something. There's not one healthy team in this tournament completely. There's not one team in this tournament that's not, you know, overcoming some type of adversity. So we've chosen not to make this an excuse and just, you know, keep writing our book um, and see what happens. Quite often we see what he did last night. He has a big second half, and, and you've seen it time and time again this year. Is there anything you say to him at halftime where you just kind of know, hey, he's capable of doing that? I don't have to say much. No, I mean, at this point, I listen to Keenan a lot more than I talk to him, you know, and, and uh, you know, certainly he's a more aggressive player, uh, the bigger the moment. Um, but he also does a great job in the point guard role, trying to get people involved early. You know, I grew up, to me, the greatest player ever was Michael Jordan. I grew up in that generation. No cable TV, but you could watch his game on WGN, that whole deal. And, um, you know, I mean, he would always get aggressive as the game goes on, too. So Keenan's a floor general. He's a... He's a guy that can play the point guard, no doubt, but he can score, which we need him to do. Okay, in the back. On uh, the right Kirk side. Bowles from the Austin American. Uh, Chris, Rick Barnes was in here talking about recruiting and developing players and said, you know, I want to get old and stay old, speaking about his players. How hard is it to balance that trying to recruit four or five lottery pick guys, but four year, three year guys, and have a great team? It's definitely. Uh, it's a challenge, but I think each program has a philosophy. Each program has a way they go about it. Um, we are looking forward to being in the neighborhood of, uh, of one and dones and consistently being able to recruit top 25, top 30 players. That's where our program's heading. Uh, we want to coach the best players. We have a university and a program that I think will attract those kinds of guys. Uh, but we also want to balance with developing players. You know, back in my day, it was Ronald Ross and Jay Jackson. Now you're seeing it firsthand with Keenan Evans and Justin and Zach. You know, Coach Smith and those guys started it. And we've tried to do the best we can finishing it. Uh, but I think there's definitely a balance between developing players within your program, but also trying to recruit the best talent you can. We will stay in the back on the right. Coach, your high school coach, Mike Kunstead, was in the stands last night supporting you. What's your relationship like with him? Yeah, I've been very fortunate in my ride uh, as, as a player and coach. And something I'm really proud of is I played for two high, Hall, Hall of Fame high school coaches, uh, Mike Kuhnstad at Irving High School right here in the Metroplex, uh, and Terry Priest, who was also in the stands last night from McCullough High School in North Houston, the Woodlands. Um, and my relationship with those two guys is important to me as any. Um, I'm always associated with Coach Knight and Pat and those guys, and I'm very proud of that. Um, but I'm also very proud of of my relationship with my two high school coaches. Coach Kuhnstadt taught me about discipline at a young age. 
taught me about the pyramid of success with John Wooden, taught me how to put my socks on without getting blisters, taught me how to play basketball without, without dribbling the ball. And then certainly Coach Priest was a guy that believed in defense and discipline um, and team basketball. So, so some of the things that you see in our teams today are a direct reflection of those guys, Mike Kunstadt and Terry Priest. Talked a lot about your defense and how proud he is of that because he feels like he maybe instilled a little bit of that in you. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that was the only way I had a chance to get on the floor. You know, growing up in Irving, I wasn't the most athletic guy. Uh, and so I learned early on, you know, you take a charge that makes Coach K happy and you stay in the game. So um, I would take a lot of charges. Um, but no, I, that's something I learned from those guys. I think, you know, a lot of programs around the country, they talk about defense, but they don't live it. Um, I've said before, you know, you go to high school and junior college practices and you see you know, on the back of people's shorts defense, and then you watch a two hour practice and they don't work on defense at all. Um, with us, you know, we talk about it and we believe it. In our 90 minute practice today, we just went over defense for 70, 70 of the 90 minutes. Um, that was something that started long ago with Coach Kunstad and with Coach Priest. And then certainly on our staff, you know, Mark Adams, uh, one of our coaches, does a great job. Uh, simply stated, Coach Adams is the best defensive coach I've ever seen. And that's no disrespect to Coach Knight or Coach Casper or all the other coaches I've been around. Uh, but Mark Adams has a way about defense. And it's, uh, it's been a big part of our team, our identity, is the work that Coach Adams has done on our staff. In the middle on the left side. Hey, Coach, it seems like Zach Smith has really worked his way back from the injury and had a really good game last night. What has he uh, brought to the team here late? Yeah, just like with Keenan, I mean, Zach is probably the story nobody's talking about. Uh, and I will, because I'm proud to represent Zach and his family and be his coach. Uh, Zach was voted a preseason All-Big 12 player, one of the top five players in the Big 12, and that's by the coaches in this league. And I couldn't vote on my own player. So the other nine coaches in this league thought Zach was one of the best top five players in this league. Uh, so that says it all. Uh, Zach gets hurt early in our Big 12 season and basically is not a part of our season really until senior night. And so for him to play the way he has in the Big 12 tournament and the way he has in the NCAA tournament yesterday, you know, I don't know if I've seen a, ever seen a more courageous effort. He obviously doesn't have his legs and he's trying to get used to the basketball side with the shooting and the skill, but he's just playing on pure heart right now. Uh, but his rebounding and defensive rim protection last night um, he made a big three in our opening win. I think it was against Texas uh, in our first round game. Um, so Zach is just playing on, on pure like heart and courage right now. Um, but he too is a guy that's got a great future in pro basketball because of his talent and skill and work ethic. And for us to overcome his injury this year and be sitting here right now, one of the top last 32 teams, uh, speaks a lot for our other guys. For Zach to come back and be able to contribute at this high of a level, you know, just speaks for him and his heart. Reminder to please state name and affiliation. Let's go on the right. Uh, Jake Winterman, ESPN. Oh, as the mayor. Okay, no, you sorry. You. Jake Winterman, ESPN Gainesville. Just a quick question on Brandon Francis. I know he was only at Florida for a year, and it was a couple seasons ago, but did he give you any insight into anything Florida does offensively, defensively, behind the scenes? Uh, yeah, of course. You know, this happens in coaching from time to time. We, we were going over personnel this morning. We just asked B, do you think we're right here? Um, and so... Yeah, of course, that's kind of a thing that happens sometimes. Uh, another thing in this game is we played um, against their power forward who played at Rice last year. Rice gave us all we could handle. We know how good he is. Um, he's actually one of my favorite players watching play and stuff. We, uh, we still talk about his shot fake today. We call it the Rice shot fake. Now we'll call it the Florida shot fake. Um, but they've got some great players on this team. Um, and, and some of the things that, um, that we've seen them do or some of the things that we believe in in basketball. So uh, we look for a great game tomorrow against a team we have nothing but respect for. Okay, Coach, we'll go in the back here on the right. Josh Peter with USA Today. Coach, how many teams do you think commit to defense the same way you do, and why don't more? I don't know. I can't, can't speak for other people. I just know my coaching uh, journey, starting with Coach Kunstad and Coach Priest, all the way up to my first college job with Danny Casper. Uh, when I was in college with Tom Penders, played defense, pressed, uh, caused turnovers. There's different ways to play this game. Um, but I learned a lot about competitiveness from Coach Penders and guarding. Those Texas teams guarded. And if you, if you thought otherwise, then you just weren't on the inside. Um, and certainly with Coach Knight, the basis of everything we did was man-to-man -man defense. 
Um, our Little Rock team was a great defensive team, ranked nationally in the top 10 all season long. And that's certainly been what we've tried to get done this year at Texas Tech. Playing in our conference with this talent and coaching, it's hard to stay up in those rankings, but we, we do stay focused on defense. Um, but I can't speak for what other people do. I can only speak for what we do. And in our opinion, we, we think defense is the key of championship runs. Again in the back. Uh, Chris, I know you probably took a lot from Bobby Knight when you were working for him. Was there one quality more than any other you took from him? And you don't do the facial expression thing he did, do you? No, I don't have that whip he had that one year either. Um, yeah, I never get tired about asking these questions. One thing was, was preparation. You know, everybody in college basketball, especially in this tournament, wants to win. Every player, every coach would do anything to win. But it's the people that would do anything to prepare to win. Uh, and coach is just a different level of preparation. Uh, I mean, in this tournament, I saw a coach watch practice tape from the day before. This was his commitment to preparation and watching and study, studying film. Um, but I think a lot of people want to win, but coach wanted to prepare to win. I also think just the commitment to graduating players. Uh, coach was always talking about so proud of the former players and graduation rate, what its guys were doing. I'm really proud of that too. We had five seniors last year, all of them graduate. And these guys that we're all enjoying watching right now, Justin, Zach, Naeem, Tommy, uh, Keenan, they're all going to graduate in May. Really proud of that. Um, some of them are already working towards their graduate degree. So I learned so much from Coach Knight, but probably the commitment to academics. And it, it wasn't just a, an APR deal or on paper or something you put in an article. I mean, it was real. It was real. Coach wanted every player that played for us to graduate. He cared about that. And uh, that's something that was really important to me that I hope in some way we're, we're emulating. Any other questions for Coach Beard? Okay, Coach, stream left underneath the light. Coach, I've heard you mention your, your love of Whataburger several times here. When, when you go, what do you get? And if you don't go to Whataburger, where else do you go for a burger? Yeah, that's the only thing on this Whataburger ride, you know, we're on. There's a lot of other places too, I mean. You know, uh, but Waterbury is a great place. I think, uh, you know, breakfast, we go, uh, we go to Quito. Um, if my girlfriend's not with me or my daughter's, I'll go extra cheese. Uh, during the day, I'm pretty easy. It's just a one mustard pickle cheese only. Uh, I'll go with the milkshake. Another thing I learned from Coach Knight, the, a root beer milkshake. You know, we got, we got this at Sonic one time, and Coach – the lady's like, so do you, you want a milkshake with root beer in it? No, I want a root beer milkshake. You want you, the root beer to substitute the milk? No, I want a root beer milkshake. Never forget Coach Knight and all were on I-20 going to, uh, I think, to Rockwall High School on that one. But, uh, no, back to Whataburger. I do enjoy a, um, a milkshake, but I never substitute that as my drink. Even in the days where I didn't have much money, and I'm very fortunate now and blessed, um, I would never be the guy that substituted it. I would go ahead, man, I got to get the unsweet tea, and then I get the milkshake, too. Um, another great thing about Whataburger is just, uh, have you ever been to Whataburger like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning? Don't go through the drive-thru. Go in next time and just get a corner booth and just watch America. <laughs> just, just watch it. You see so many cool things at Whataburger. You'll see good things. You'll see, you'll see a guy pick up a tab for somebody else. You'll see somebody clean up a plate, you know, that wasn't his. You'll see some of the bad things in America, too, at a Waterbury Lake. But, um, but I love people watching, and I, I, uh, that's one of many things I do. Coach, I think we have one last question. Extreme right. I want to ask a Waterbury follow-up, if I could, about Keenan Evans. What would Keenan Evans be on the Waterbury menu, if you can figure out what that is? That's a tough one, huh? A tough one. Sorry. You know, back in the day, you could say stuff like this, and your players would never see it. But today, you know, they see it before I see it. It's like you gotta be careful. You know, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, we got Moro on our team this year, and Moro coming from Italy, he loves pasta and cheesecake. So we tried to incorporate those two things in every pregame meal. Uh, classic Moro story. He'd been in Lubbock for about four or five days, and he came to my office. You know, he's a quiet guy. Coach, can I talk to you? As a coach, you don't you don't like those. You. Normally something's going on. You don't like those. So I said, yeah, Moro, come in. He's like, coach, uh, everything's good. Apartment, coaching staff, language, no problem. Academics, I got it. But uh, the fuel the body part, coach, because that's what we call our nutrition, fuel the body in our process. He says, too much chicken strips. Do we eat chicken strips every meal? Is this America? 
And so uh, we've tried to get away from the chicken strips a little bit this year and go with pasta and cheesecake for more. All right, Coach. That's, uh, I think that's good. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. Thank you very much. Good luck tomorrow. Susan, did you get the players? Okay. I just got them. I just saw them.
Okay, media in the back room. Florida has left its locker room and is heading this way. Again, Florida is walking down the steps and the Gators will be on stage in just a few seconds for media in the workroom. We are now joined by the uh, Florida Gators, our student athletes, Jalen Hudson, uh, Chris Chioza, and uh, Kavarius Hayes. Guys, welcome to the room. Hadn't been that long since we saw you. Questions for any of the three? Okay, guys, we'll go on your right toward the back. Hey, for Chris and Kavarius, uh, Chris Harry, FloridaGators.com. Your memories of Brandon Francis. Do you have a, a just going up against him? What'd you think of him as a teammate and that kind of and how ironic it is for him to be on the other bench when you guys are gonna play to go to the sweet sixteen? Well, um, I didn't really know him that long. Uh, when I first got here, uh, he seemed like very energetic. You know, he's always excited, even though know, whether he's on the court or not, he seemed like a really good team player. Um, I'm excited to see um, how well we do uh, matching up against him. Uh, yeah, like he said, he had a he always had a lot of energy. Um, it was just he was one of those guys that always you know had something you know different to him. Uh, he was always you know amped up. Uh, you could tell he you know he loved the game and uh, it meant a lot to him. And he was just always excited to be able to you know be out there on the court and he wanted to do whatever he could do as a teammate. You know help us and, you know, better himself as well. We'll move to the left side. Uh, Chris, not sure how much you've gotten to see of Texas Tech or how much you got to see of the game last night, but how excited are you for the uh, opportunity to go against Keenan Evans? Obviously, last night you have to chase Mobley and Adams around. Next game it'll be Evans. Just how excited are you for that opportunity? Uh, I mean, he's a, another great point guard and a great player. So, you know, anytime you get, you know, go up against a great, a great player, you know, it, it helps you elevate your game, but uh, you know I'm I'm not gonna make too much out of that. Um, play like any other game, and just go out there, you know, run the team, do what coaches ask me to do, and just you know make sure that everybody's focused and doing what they got to do. Let's go on the back now on the right. Chris Wendell Barnhouse with the Athletic. Uh, you being a senior, the point guard, and it sort of being quote unquote your team. How much like responsibility and maybe angst have you had, you know, when it's been so much of a roller coaster? When the team has had, had periods of struggling, how much did you feel like it was kind of up to you to maybe get things back on course? Uh, with this team, we don't have just one one person that's you know the 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 guy. You would say we we try to you know collectively come together the team and lead each other. Um, but you know, being the older guy, when we do have those those times, I do. I uh, feel like I have a little bit more responsibility, um, you know, to try to figure out what's going on and keep guys, you know, focused and, you know, get our get our focus back when we lose it. But uh, like I said, it's it's on everybody. We we try to hold each other accountable. It's not just one person. Uh, so. 
Let's move toward the front. Yeah, Kevin Brockway, Gainesville Sun. Question for Kavarius or uh, Chris. Um, obviously, uh, you're in Texas. There are going to be a lot of uh, Red Raider fans here. They kind of filled up the arena last night. Uh, just the, the challenge of, of going through a road environment and uh, how much could you draw from maybe uh, some of your experiences in the SEC beating Kentucky at Rep Arena in terms of dealing with that? Kavarius? Um, I feel like we've uh, play better in our, our away games. You know, we um, come together knowing it's all of us on the court, the coaches, and everybody else is on the staff. So it's going to feel like feel like we're pretty comfortable playing against, you know, the crowd that has their fans backing them. It's going to be a good game for us. I feel like it's going to be. Other questions? Okay, we'll stay on the right and move back toward the uh, back part of the room. Yes, Wendell. Wendell Barnhouse, me athletic for Jalen. I kind of similar question to what I asked Chris, which he didn't want to answer that much about it being about him. How much have you seen him be kind of the leader of the team? Is it, it you know he kind of deflected that, but is he kind of the guy that keeps everybody together? And uh, your chance to play with him this year, what's that been like for you? And if you answer nicely, he'll probably give you a lot of passes tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, he's definitely been one of our leaders. Uh, like he also mentioned, uh, it's been a lot of us, you know what I mean, leading. Um, I feel like he does more leading by example, you know what I mean, bringing his own energy, uh, playing defense, uh, picking up full court, uh, making the extra pass, things like that, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, he's definitely been very helpful for us, a uh, big part of uh, our success. In the back again. Jalen Newey Scruggs, NBC5, Dallas here. Uh, back to the question about the crowd. A um, lot of Red Raider fans there yesterday. Um, did you get to see the crowd before you guys got in there, before your game at all? And, and just what are your thoughts on basically this being a home game for them because they've got six guys on their team from Dallas? Uh, I didn't really get a chance to uh, see the crowd. I could definitely hear it. Um, it seems like they'll have a lot of people there. Um, the fans really can't do anything for them on the court. Uh, we'll have to bring our own energy. I still feel really good about it. I mean, we play some really good, tough teams at their place, and uh, we're able to come out with the W. So uh, I feel really good about it. Um, I don't think, I don't, like I said before, I don't think their fans can do anything to help them on the floor. So I think we'll be fine. We'll move to the left. Uh, question for Chris. Texas Tech, sort of all season, their MO has been slowing the other team down, tiring them out, getting them fatigued, and sort of crashing at the end and finishing the game off. How do you guys not let them set the tempo and play your quick transition-oriented offense and defense that you guys like to get into? What's sort of your strategy into setting the pace early for your team? Uh, I mean, we've, we've played teams like that before. They want to slow us down. Um, you know, we're just going to try to, you know, start on the defensive end. Um, that's going to get our offense going if we get some stops and uh, get out in transition. Uh, that's the main thing. Just we're not really worried about the offense too much. Just we're focused on the defensive end, and that's where it's gonna, you know, get us baskets on the other end. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move up front. On your right, Ken Davis from the Athletic. Um, any one of you can answer this if you want. The, the SEC is off to a pretty good start in the tournament. Uh, did very well yesterday. You got you and and uh, Tennessee both here. I just wondered if you could give your if you could give your thoughts about the league, maybe its national reputation, how much you think it improved this season. Any other thoughts that you have? Let's start with Jalen. Um, yeah, the SEC is really tough. Uh, I don't really think they get a lot of credit. Um, it's a very physical league, and uh, the way they've been calling the games have been very physical, and I don't think a lot of teams. Um, in their conference have been even been used to it. Um, that's one thing I noticed coming from the ACC as uh, very like a completely different game. And I, I think the, the SEC teams were more uh, adjusted to it. You want to Vargas? Uh, hey, yeah, like like he said, the SEC is a you know very tough league. Um, you know, it's shown that the last couple of years it's every year it's gotten better and they put more and more teams in the tournament and more and more teams have gone deeper and made uh, longer runs than they've done in the past. And it, it just goes to show you how, how good that conference is from top to bottom. Um, a lot of that has to do with the physicality and, you know, the athleticism and 
a lot that goes with the coaches that, that are in the league. You know, they don't get a lot of credit, as much credit as they should. Um, it's a good a job they do with the teams they have. You take a little pride in that with what's happening right now? Uh, yeah, I mean, a, a little bit. Uh, just, a, just a little bit. <laughs> Any other questions? No hands? All right, guys, we'll uh, let you uh, get ready and go to practice here. Thank you for coming and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. The SID from uh, Florida Denver Parlor is here or was. So if you need anything else from the Gators, just see Denver. Let's see, Coach White will appear in the room in 10 minutes at 4.15. So I have about a 10 minute break before Coach White joins us.
Should be in three minutes. They say he's up in the holding room, so should be. We'll probably start on time. Uh -huh. Florida media, uh, we will begin with Coach White probably in about two minutes. So any media from that cover the Gators, um, we will be starting shortly. Okay, we are ready to resume uh, with the University of Florida head coach, Mike White. Coach, your thoughts um, going into uh, tomorrow's game? You have practice coming up in a bit, so your yeah. thoughts. Anxious to get after it a little bit and first and foremost get a, get a good long stretch, uh, have our guys feel a little bit better about their bodies. Um, competitive game last night, of course. Uh, anxious to move on. You know, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. It's a, it's an unbelievable tournament. It's a great experience for our guys. Really pleased with the way that we played last night for about 36 minutes, and uh, not, not necessarily the way that we finished, but um, you know, beat a good team, and, and we've got a huge test in, in front of us against a Texas Tech team that's had a, a great, great year. Okay, coach. Let's go to questions here on your right toward the front. Yeah, Kevin Brockway, Gainesville. So, Mike, in addition to dealing with all their talent and their guards, you're going to have about. Uh, a sea of red in here, probably about uh, 14, 15,000. You guys have dealt with the road environments before in the SEC, but just kind of the challenge of, of that and having to deal with uh, the crowd and how do you think you guys can respond from that and draw from that and what you went through in the SEC? Well, it, it's, it definitely, there's, there's no advantage to it for us, obviously, um, but we've, we've just got to deal with it. Um, and we've done it before. I don't think any team in the country's more battle tested than we are over the last two years, considering what we had to go through last year uh, with the renovations to Exact Tech Arena. Uh, we've played a ton of games away from home. Um, we've played a ton of neutral site games, of course. And this one, I thought Chris Chios made a good point last night. This, I, I think this one will be comparable to the Gonzaga game, which we didn't get any um, computer favorability for, unfortunately. Um, 
but it, that was a road game, you know, and tomorrow will be a road game as well. Um, it would be a great environment. It would be a great environment. Uh, but I, I'm more concerned with defending them and figuring out a way to score against the, the third-ranked defense uh, in the country. Coach, we'll go to your left. Uh, Jake Winterman, ESPN Gainesville. Coach, it, it's not like a Florida and Texas Tech have any recent history. The last time they played, Bill Koss was actually a freshman. So, Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that was, that was a while back. Wow, but, um, a couple years ago. A couple years ago. But what was your immediate impression of Texas Tech's backcourt from the film that you saw? You know, it, it's funny. I hadn't had a chance to see them play over the last couple years. You, you follow scores, and, and you know Coach Beard's got it rolling, of course, and they've had a great year. And I just hadn't seen them live a bunch during the season. Um, you know, if, if I'm not – if I'm not watching an SEC game, I'm, I'm probably tuned in to the Blue Devils and, you know, a couple other teams. Um, more than anything, Keenan Evans is terrific. Um, they're freshmen. Where do they come from? My goodness, the, the years that they've had, uh, those, their freshman class is, is big time. Um, they've got a good mix of those guys along with Keenan and some older guys, some good seniors. Um, Athletically, they've got good pieces of, of some big physical guys, some big guards, some length athleticism. They're, I think their team speed is as good as we've played all year, uh, which helps them in transition offense and defense. The way they change ends of the floor is top notch. Um, and then overall, as I mentioned, figuring out a way to score against these guys could be our biggest test. Third ranked in, in KenPalm.com. Um, they, they, they don't have any deficiencies defensively. They're good offensively. They're going to be hard to guard. Um, but man, do they, do they lock you up. Uh, Chris has got these guys really defending and, and playing really, really hard. Okay, in the middle. Wendell Barnhouse in The Athletic. Um, how have you seen Chris evolve since, you know, obviously he was there when you got there. Yeah. Um, and this year with the team sort of being up and down, do you think he's felt more responsibility to when things were struggling? He mentioned that he thinks there's a lot of leaders on this team, but is he really kind of the key guy? And do you think he's felt the burden maybe of trying to get things right when things were not going right? I, I think to a certain extent, you know, Chris is a quiet leader. He's a leader by example. And we have a few of those guys. Um, our most demonstrative guy, our, our biggest communicator is Kavarius Hayes. Um, we just have a bunch of really introverted, quiet guys. You know, Kevin and, and Jake have heard it all year and they, and they know it. Um, it it's just a, it's a unique group in that regard. That we've got really, really good guys. Um, just w w we've we've lacked that that overall edge. And and Chris, Chris has been challenged by the, by myself and our staff all year, and he's been challenged by his teammates as well. And he's become a little bit more vocal. He's trying to get out of his comfort zone a little bit. He's just not um, a, a big extroverted guy. He's that said though, when he says something, our guys lock in. Um, and they, they continue to challenge him to step up and be more and more vocal because they, they want it, and they've expressed that to him in team meetings. Um, it, what, what he says goes a long way, especially with our younger guys. Sure. As far as this team, this was kind of a team in transition with the lineup, I guess, you know, some new guys kind of getting mixed in. How much yeah. was Chris, you know, kind of involved with trying to make – everything fit together he's he's been great in that regard I mean it's such a luxury to have a to have a point guard that it's like last night he gets 11 assists and, and zero turnovers he's our best defender he's on the all ACC defensive team he's held it all together and I would say he if he's if he's one one a would be Igor Kulichov um, those guys have been constants for us and um, Chris has helped it all come together uh, to a certain extent and um, we, we were, we added a couple pieces, of course, and Igor and Jalen and, and some freshmen, and then we were without a few pieces that we thought we'd have. And um, to be able to count on Chris Knight in a night out has given us a chance on, you know, on, on most occasions, of course. And, you know, I, I know that the narrative with us is, is that we've been up and down, and that's, um, I've been open and honest about that all year, and, and I, uh, we're, we're not hiding from that. You know, we, we've been, we've looked like a top 10 team at times, and we've looked like an NIT team at times, but, Chris, Chris also has, the year he's had has allowed this team to, despite the inconsistencies, to do a lot of really good things too. You know, I beat these guys up all year, but at the end of the day, Chris and his group, Chris and his teammates, 
led the country in, in top 25 wins with six. I think, I think we finished second in the country in, in quad one wins. Um, and here we are in the second round of the NCAA tournament again. So I'm really proud of Chris. I, I'm so happy he's my point guard. He's had a great career. And, and I'm, I'm most excited that his legacy will forever be that he had a good career. And he had a really good senior year in addition to the shot. It wasn't just about the one shot. Again in the back, here on the right. Adam Grossbart, Dallas Morning News. Uh, the SEC started 5-0 and in the NCAA tournament this year. There's been a lot of talk about how the conference has improved, but what does it mean to prove it in the tournament, too? Yeah, I just think it, um, just think it proves it a little bit more. It, it, ho hopefully it sinks in nationally what this, what this league's capable of, um, how this league has grown from top to bottom. And, and there's teams that aren't in this tournament that are really good. Uh, it's, um, it's a talented league. It's a deep league. A bunch of really good players, a bunch of really proud fan bases, and I think it'll only continue to grow. I'm anxious to see how we finish um, with this tournament. Uh, I, I, I think that, that the league, night in and night out in this tournament, is, is going to continue to show people how good we are. We'll stay here on the right, but move toward the front. Yeah, Kevin Brockway, Gainesville. So, Mike, you discussed our defense. Uh, what in particular stands out about Texas Tech's uh, defense that makes them hard to score on? Uh, team speed, length, athleticism. And we've played a lot of teams this year that you watch on film and you say, guys, you know, in talking to your team, guys, this guy's really athletic. They got like five of those guys, you know, and they've got veteran guards. Um, they play really hard. Again, their team speed and their interchangeability. They've got versatile defenders that they all, they move really well. And so they do more switching uh, in their man-to-man -man probably than any team we've seen this year. And they're able to not only get away with it, but they're able to flourish in it, um, uh, making teams stagnant at times, taking teams out of their actions at times, because they've got front court guys that can lock up guards, and they've got guards that can defend in the post. Um, and, in, and they wreak some habit, too, with, with getting in passing lanes and having active hands and turning you over. And that's where they're incredibly dangerous, is those pick sixes, getting out transition offense off of turnovers. Coaches left. Uh, Coach, Texas Tech sort of asked Chris about it, but they try and slow you down, wear you out, and kill you at the end. How, how do you keep it from getting into one of those half-court games and make it a quicker type game for you guys and getting at the transition? Because that's when you guys excel. Yeah, in transition offense, we, 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 we like to get quick open shots or late open shots. We want open shots, but we want them to, you know, we, we don't want them to be out in transition offense either. So, I mean, that, that transition game, we'd like to win. I, I don't. I don't know that we can plan on definitely winning it um, because, the, because of the team speed factor. I mean, that's where they're really, really good. But our floor balance has, has got to be great. We've got to set our half-court defense to have a chance. Um, and then they grind you out offensively, too, a la Arkansas and Tennessee and South Carolina, uh, where they're in constant movement. And, and some of their defensive numbers probably are helped by the fact that they wear you down a little bit with the ball in their hands. And, they got five guys cutting, and they can all pass, dribble, shoot, and they're all screening. And you know, so they're going to test our discipline defensively as well. Um, and if we can get stops, hopefully we can get out in transition. And if we've got something early, we'd like to take it. But we, again, we don't want to. We, we've been there before. Uh, Loyola Chicago did it to us to start, and then it seemed like a bunch of people figured that out. Where we don't want to play defense for 80 percent of the game. You know, we we'd like early quick ones, but we've got to be. We've got to be choosy. We've got to make good decisions in transition offense as well. Move back on the right toward the front again. Yeah, Kevin Brockwood games with some. Mike, uh, Keith yesterday, nine, eight rebounds, three blocks. Just, uh, you know, he was uh, obviously a perimeter scorer last year, but how has he developed into being maybe a tougher player uh, that you kind of need inside? Yeah, I, I, Kevin, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think he has, he's gotten a little tougher. Um, he, he's, he's still really young with understanding how big and strong he is. I think I'm, I'm hopeful that a couple more off seasons, you, you'll see a finished product where um, he can be more of a balanced inside out guy um, or outside in or however you want to term it. But you know, 90% of his game right now is facing up. But, he, but he's got such a, um, a gifted body and strength. And uh, I liked him attacking the rim a little bit last night. Of course, it was a little bit different matchup a um, little bit less length in there, and he was able to uh, to have a little bit of success. Um, so he's he's still growing in that regard. 
we've, in the uh, back now. We, we've talked about how this is kind of a quiet group of guys, but you have a guy like Avarius Hayes who's very outgoing, big personality. Yeah. How valuable is that aspect to the locker room culture? He's back there being the mock interviewer with the guys right now, playing around. Yeah. Just, what, what's he bring to the team in that element? You know, I, when I talk about us being so um, so quiet, it, I, I'm, I'm more so talking about in, be, in between the lines. Kavarius might be our most uh, extroverted guy in the locker room and, and um, at the apartment or what have you, social settings, team dinners. We got four or five guys uh, other than him that will cut it up a little bit too. You know, we, we've got guys got strong personalities and they're fun to be around. He's he though more so than anybody else ha has become the the guy that challenges others. When his team loses a drill in practice, we try to make everything competitive, of course, and every day in practice. And he's the one guy that that has learned to hate losing, and he makes he makes it known, and he'll call a guy out. Hey, that's not acceptable. Um, even when he maybe has, has messed a play up or he hadn't played to his ability, um, he's our most competitive guy on a daily basis. And that, I think, overall has made us a little bit more competitive. Again, we're not the most competitive team. We're not the toughest team. But this team has really grown in those regards. I've talked about, a lot about that in terms of how much better we are defensively today than we were four months ago and on the glass and how much grittier we are. And without Kavarius bringing that presence, I don't, I don't think we grow nearly as much in that area. We'll stay on coaches, right? Chris Hayes, Orlando Sentinel. Mike, staying with Kavarius, um, in the half-court defensive set, once the, like, they do like to penetrate, I think, 36 points in the paint last night. What kind of challenge does that present for a guy like Kavarius? A lot, a lot. You know, Kavarius and Dante Bassett and Gorjak Gak, um, and then our fours, Keith Stone and Igor Kulichov, there's there, there going to be a lot of pressure on those guys to uh, to defend without fouling. Texas Tech lives at the foul line. They live at the rim, not only with penetration and with, with post touches, but they're one of the best cutting teams that we've played this year. Um, good passing team, you know, to to be able to, to facilitate uh, to those cuts. Uh, I think the speed and quickness allow them to be a good cutting team as well. And... So our anchors on the interior have got to be good. They've, they've got positionally, we've got to be really sound. Um, and then we've got to, we've got to play physical, um, but, but legal at the same time. Uh, and then our guards got to help them by, by trying to do the best they can um, by not getting face cut, back cut, and then, of course, containing penetration. Moving back toward the uh, back of the room. I, I know you were, you were telling DeAndre not to dunk at the end of the game last night, but. Uh, what's the value of the experience for the freshman Mike and DeAndre just getting in the games on the stage? Yeah, I talked to Dre today, and he had no idea. Um, he, he, he hadn't been told that before. He hadn't been in that situation. And uh, uh, he told me that he had seen a clip that somebody maybe had, 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 had tweeted where I was going crazy when he was about to dunk it. But I said, hey, I'm not mad at you. You're a freshman. You'll figure that out. But um, in terms of sportsmanship, we don't, we don't need that one. Um, but he said the dunk felt good, you know, happy that he, he got his, uh, his name on the scoreboard. Uh, but he, it, it's a great experience. Uh, it's a great experience. I, I thought he provided uh, some, some decent minutes. Um, I thought Michael Carr was, was really good, really good. Uh, he, he made some timely baskets for us, and I thought he was really good defensively as well. And um, we're not playing as many freshmen as, as Texas Tech. Um, but I think any, any of these type experiences, especially NCAA tournament experiences for your younger guys, can only help continue to grow your culture as a program. Anything else for Coach White? No? Okay, Coach, we'll let you head to practice. Thanks for being here today, Thank and you. see you tomorrow. Good luck. All right. Thanks, guys.